Um, so tonight we've got uh, the work session starting at six. Um, and then uh, we'll have our regular meeting uh, that'll consist of the Pledge of Allegiance, roll call, changes to the agenda, um, consent agenda, and then uh, new business. So um, anybody have any questions before we start? All right, I'll call the work session to order at 6.01. Do I need to? Yeah, totally off. Yeah, I don't yep. think that's a, it needs to be that official, but I'll do it for fun. Great. You can just jump in. Uh, yeah, that'd be great because clearly I'm not. Um, I, I I got ready you. Ready either. So hi, good evening. Um, my understanding is that the emergency operations plan um, was originally brought to council for um, an update and promulgation in 2022, and there were some questions that council had, and it didn't quite get reviewed and approved. So um, we've taken a look at the document. It's been out to the department heads for review as well. And we're gonna bring it back to you. But before just bringing, it's a huge document, we understand that. So rather than just bringing it to you and asking you to accept it as is, we thought we'd answer whatever questions that you have or had from the previous meeting and then give you until at least the next council meeting to review it on your you know, off time because that's how you want to spend your nights and days. So um, basically, this is just a work session to gather information from you and to give you information so that you feel comfortable about this document and about our process for emergency operations. <laughs> so the original EOP was written in 2017 by a company hired through FEMA through the state to help all the cities that didn't have emergency operations plan do so. And so it was through a grant through FEMA. And the plan is modeled exactly like the county plan, which is modeled like every other city plan, which is modeled like every other county plan and state plan. So we're not out on a limb doing something new. So how did I get into emergency management? And I suspect that I did it the same way that you are doing it in the sense of, I have some responsibilities as when I started as chief and it scares the, you know, what out of me and I want to be proficient in it. I want to be able to stand on a podium or in front of the news cameras and say, this is what we did. We were ready. We did the best we could. And I think that that's probably the situation that you feel a little bit of angst over in your roles. So I want to help you get that out that we do know what we're doing. We're okay. So we could do better. There's always, I always like to operate this stuff on a what's next. What can we do next to make it even better? But we'll we'll go through with you what some of your concerns might be. So tonight you won't be making any decisions. You'll be able to ask questions. And then at the next council meeting, we'll bring it back to you with any changes that we need to make after tonight for promulgation. Good so far? All right. I'm going to start that. Yep. Can, can we, if we don't find anything tonight, when we do send something, because we're going to read it all, I'm sure. Yep. Between now and the next meeting, uh, that we can throw stuff at you. That's fine by me if that works for you. Council, so mm -hmm. Or if you just have questions, I'm happy to help you with that. I have to confess I didn't read it all. What? Sorry. It's a long document. It is. Must be so. that. Yeah, I'm sure that. It, you know, a lot of it is redundant too. Mm -hmm. um, so just a little bit about the structure to better understand that. So this is an all hazards plan, right? Which means that all natural man-made, all of those hazards are considered. There are two other documents that we're gonna be bringing before you. One is the natural uh, mitigation plan and how we can, natural hazards mitigation plan. How do we mitigate some of the things that might affect our area? What can we do ahead of time? And then the other plan is the COOP plan or continuity of operations plan. What do we do during and after an emergency that is dressed by this EOP to keep our city moving forward and provide services that we need to provide? So those, those three things um, work together. The other thing that we're gonna need to bring back to you and we'll have that at the next council meeting is our standing municipal code that directs how the emergency operations plan is administered or works uh, was last updated in 1989. So we feel like it's probably a good time to correct some of that and bring that up to code as well. Um, and we'll make it mirror what the counties is for the most part, as far as uh, it discusses your legal authority and some responsibilities. 
to which was that the code that that's the sandy municipal code? code yeah six i think 6.09 for building code Something. or for it's, it's no. entitled it's entitled to yeah, yeah title two no it's just a it's so if the city is going to have emergency operations plan we have to have an ordinance that yeah. says how we're going to manage that so they just point at each okay, other guys. basically okay go ahead with the first one yeah the next slide yeah okay. oh i'm sorry the the one that says what is okay all right so we talked about it, it was originally written in 2012 the coop plan and our, the goal of all of these is to maximize our safety to the public, right? Save life first and then minimize any damage or cost to um, our constituents or our citizens. All right, now I'm ready. Okay. I'm trying to follow along with you here. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, so when do we need the emergency operations plan? This is a good question for a lot of people. So anytime we get into a situation that is normally outside of our scope of daily oper activity, we should be activating the emergency operations plan. And it can be done like during the heat events, Clackamas County activated theirs, but they only had one person working there and staffing it and just kind of making sure that nothing's changed in the county. So we can do it for smaller things, but just things that are outside the normal. And we can do it for things that are pre-planned. For example, a huge comp, comp concert or a huge public gathering that we know is coming. We could establish a, use the EOP and set up our emergency operations center for that. So it doesn't matter what it is, if it's routine or whatever, it's just something that's a little bit bigger and it's gonna need some big, better oversight. Um, and we definitely want to do it like if there's an emergency. So fires, and let's hope we don't need it anytime soon. <laughs> so fires, weather, terrorism, and terrorism isn't just like what we see on the news. It can also be environmental terrorism, you know, things like that. So, and I'm, did I see a question coming? No, no. Oh, okay. Sorry, no. All right. Um, next one. Yep. So some legal authorities, there are several ORSs. The main one is uh, ORS 401, which governs emergency management. And it tells us what we can and can't do as a city, a county, a state. Um, and it tells us what kinds of things our electeds are gonna be doing. <clears throat> so the ORS allows us to divert funds. So if we have money in one section of our budget, we can divert it to another to cover our expenses during this emergency to order in things that we need. Uh, it authorizes the local plans. Um, it receive, it allows us to receive services through mutual aid. And we also, we already have established mutual aid agreements through all the cities in Clackamas County and the county. So that's already pre, uh, that's already been completed and is in existence. Um, and that allows us to share resources and um, cooperate with one another. And it talks about how those bills that we incur at somebody else's resource would be paid and, and the timeliness of that. Um, that. This also provides some legal protections for the city and for the electeds, that um, ORS. Um, and then it talks about how we request help from the state and through federal assistance. So if you think about we have an issue in Sandy and we need more help. Who do we go to? The county. And if the county has several cities that are saying, hey, we need more help, who does the county go to? The state, right? And then the state's now overwhelmed and then they go to the federal government. So it just kind of goes like that. Next one. So I know there was some questions too about lines of secession. So in the green is um, all your employees that work for the city. And so the city manager is the top of that food pyramid. He's the, he's by uh, your statute, he is the emergency manager, all right? Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean he's running the emergency operations center. It just means he's responsible that we have a plan. We have code that says we have a plan and that we're implementing it properly. And he helps the emergency operations center command staff get what they need and and liaise with you yes sir so so you described what the plan is and why we need it and yeah and who's in charge of it or yep. ensuring it who and who enables it? who 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 decides now is the time we need to implement 
this process? So it depends on the event. So if it's a fire event, the, the fire chief can implement it. If it's a police related event or a natural disaster or something along that, that would be either police and fire or, or one or the other. The city manager can certainly implement that, say it's fire, but we're not actively fighting the fire, but it has negative impacts to our community. He can, he can implement the emergency operations center by the EOP. Um, and so it's a very fluid system that allows it to be as small or as big as you need it to be and dependent upon what you what it is you're trying to solve. If, for example, when uh, we had <clears throat> the Estacada fires that two years ago, 20, longer 20, than 20, that, 20, four, four years that ago, yeah. Yeah. Um, we did not enact uh, or activate the EOP um, here, fire had their, uh, it was FOC, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, we were sitting in their FOC, right? We, we were involved heavily, but it wasn't the city of Sandy's emergency operations plan that was being utilized. For the but fires. because we were contracting with Estacada when they had a fire, I was down in their emergency operations center for the police side. So it's, it's not an automatic mandatory structure and it isn't, doesn't require all positions to be filled. It's just very fluid as to what it is you're trying to deal with. Yeah, I, I was just curious as like, as you described just a diverse, you know, outline of what mm -hmm. it could be used for. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, there can't be one person that says it is or it isn't. And to your point, it's mm -hmm. police chief, fire chief. City manager. And and realistically, let's say um I'm up at my home and something major kicks off, any of the patrol or command staff that are working can activate the emergency operations center on my behalf before I even get there or just start start the process because it's it's already obvious it's beyond the scope of just our normal daily things. So we we're, we're gonna need to call people in and and have a command center. So I've never had this happen before, but if there's a disagreement, is there a, the police chief is final word, the fire chief, city manager? So if it's a fire situation, it's the fire chief. And if it is something that is law enforcement related or just the city alone, uh, it would likely be your city manager and or myself. I, I'm aware you're going to probably get to this about funds and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. being made available. Yep. Once we call an emergency, but if the city manager feels like we need to have something and the fire chief decides not, and is there a process? so the the fire chief has a very large territory, right? And some some of the decisions that they might make have nothing to do with the city at all, and the funding isn't something that we would provide, so he wouldn't be making recommendations that way. Likely what would happen if we were both activated fire and police, we would be together in what, you know, in the same room. So he would say, I have this need. Police can help fill that. Or I can say, I have this need. Fire can help fill that. Um, but he's responsible for his things like uh, search and rescue, uh, fire control, evacuation. And then there was there's some components of that we'll have as well, but we'll be responsible for the looters and blocking traffic and getting getting the roads clear and things sure. of that nature. But ideally, we're in a, a command together so that we're helping each other's role. Okay. Okay. So the lines of secession are pretty clear. Um, if he's not available, then it's Jeff. And if Jeff isn't available, then I'm I'm in charge. And then if I'm not available, then Jenny's in charge. And then on your side, um, the mayor has the emergency policy and government's responsibility. Um, but whenever, whenever possible, it should be a quorum, right? It should be some conversation. But if there's an emergency, you, we can't contact you. Uh, something's happened to all of you, <laughs> something along that line, then it can just be the, the mayor. And then, then then the next case is the council president and then city councilors in order of secession, and that's by seniority. And that's how the county works as well. Means you call me last. 
<laughs> so the next slide, please. Not in order of importance. So um, here's the life cycle, basically, of emergency management. So the upper left corner is the mitigation piece. And that's that's one of your biggest tasks in this plan is, is helping us identify and deal with the things that we know may occur and how do we mitigate loss of life and loss of property. So those things can be like uh, Kelly O'Neill and I were just talking this morning about a lahar. It's possible that there could be a lahar. However, there's not much we're going to be able to do to mitigate from the lahar damage. Fortunately for us, most of the lahar flow follows the same path as water, right? Um, it's going to have effects on the basin, but probably not much with the city. Slow moving, we can get people out. So how can we mitigate the problems associated with that particular thing? We have to think about traffic control design. How do we get people evacuated? How would we get people notified? Things of that nature. So um, lots of times when we have some mitigation pieces or prevention pieces, we'll come back to you with ideas. It might be Kelly with some flood issues, um, things like that. It could be even something that we work on with fire uh, to help like our water treatment areas and things like that. So that's one of the roles that you'll play in this emergency operations plan is how do we mitigate things and, and keep us safer. The next is the preparedness piece. So that this is part of that. Getting some training, uh, making sure that you understand what your roles are, um, approve some funding so that we can move this where it needs to be. So the plan is is this is a living document and it should be updated all, a lot and changed as things change. Um, so that would be one of your responsibilities. And then under the response one in the lower right hand corner, uh, we're going to need you to be present, um, maybe just by phone or just by Zoom. Um, but what, we are going to need you to be present and help make some policy decisions because things are going to be moving fast. So we need you to be participatory in PIO briefings, public information officer briefings, and, and we'll set up a regular cadence of some meetings for you to attend so that you can be briefed. And then part of that also is going to be you helping us with your constituents and getting the word out. And I'm going to caution you, the most important part of this is one voice goes out. You can all say the message but it has to be one message because if it's not one message, we're going to have confusion and panic. So it has to be something that's written for you with info input from the people that are dealing with the emergency, like your fire chief, your police chief, your public works director, uh, Tyler, all of those people. And then we'll dra help draft some messages for you. And then we need you to help get the word out to your constituents about what we need them to do to stay safe. Talking points. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then recovery. So this is also where that COOP plan comes in, right? How do we get back to norm, to business so that we're providing water, we're providing electricity, we're providing police services, everybody's safe, they can get back to their homes. How do we get rid of the debris in the roadways? I was deployed to uh, Hurricane Andrew in Tamiami, and it, it took a long time for the roads to be passable. So we had to do everything by helicopter, right? So there's a lot, you get a bad earthquake or a bad flood, debris management is a huge issue. So um, recovery and that coop plan is gonna be super critical. And so your input on those things and your support of these things is, is a big portion of your role because it can't be successful unless it's supported at the top. And that's where you guys are. So, all right, next one. So before disaster, we talked a little bit, we have to build some resilience in our community. So for a while we were doing pretty good. We, I, I don't know if you remember, but we have an AM radio station, 1660 on your AM dial. And for a while we were really good about having that run all the time. And we had messages that we would update. Um, like right now we would talk about the uh, mountain festival and traffic and things that would get around it. And then we would just change the message. Um, well, in research just recently, we found out that there was a fuse blown on and it hasn't been working for quite some time. So uh, Greg, bless his heart, came in, fixed that for us. 
and he thinks there's some software updates he can do that we will be able to update the message on the fly with a computer. So we don't have to do recordings and then load them and all that other stuff. So there's all these neat things that we can do before a disaster um, or during, but that's just one of them. So support and encouragement of a robust program. Before I left, this program was pretty robust. We were doing pretty good. It's, it's not quite where I'd like to see it. Um, and I'd really encourage that as funding and, and bandwidth occur, you look at having an emergency management person for your city. Mm -hmm. They could do other things as well, like PIO would be a really good combination. That's what the school district had done, and that worked very well. Um, but at some point, you're going to get big enough where that's going to be very critical. And this stuff needs to be updated pretty regularly. Um, so, and then also the championing of community risk reduction, that mitigation plan we talked about, um, and then encourage preparedness and start with your own homes. And we used to talk about a three day supply of food and water, a two week supply of food and water. And now the trend really is just like our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents have a great pantry, you know, just have a good well-stocked pantry and a good supply of water and stuff to make you comfortable when it's hot, cold, no power, whatever, and start with yourself. And that's what in our emergency operations plan we talk about with um, the staff is start with your, your people, make sure they're good at home before they try to come in and help, right? Make sure their families are set. Same with you. Make sure you're okay. Your family's okay. Everybody's set. And then, but, and then in some of your talking points with your constituents, encourage this behavior, encourage preparedness, that would help us out a lot because a lot of people think we're just going to fix it and we're not going to be able to, right? We're not going to be able to necessarily drop and bring them water. So, and then also training as we move forward, having some training, I think would be ideal for the city. And then I would encourage you to attend that. We've done some in the past. I think Carl's been there mm -hmm. where we did some up at the police department and we kind of set up the EOC so you could see what it looks like. And I'm happy to do that again for you if anybody has interest in seeing what that looks like. And I'd be more than interested. One of you, some sort of preparedness uh, knowledge about it anyway through all the council. I, I remember the last time that we called for a, a emergency um, a windstorm, if I recall. Could be. Trees were all over the different roads. Uh, there were some housing problems because the trees fell on the houses. Mm -hmm. This is probably at least 10 years ago. And there were a lot of things, like you were saying, how do you get from one spot to the other without having to saw through 20 trees at any one block? Mm -hmm. and power people, lines. Power lines, all that kind of stuff. It took quite a bit of uprunning because, if I recall, Bill King was the mayor at the time, and um, he was available, but he couldn't get from his house to the... the Mm -hmm. I don't remember if it was their police station or not, or just here. That was a command center. But anyway, it was tough to get him to the place he needed to be. So mm -hmm. there was some phone line stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we all need to be kind of familiar. Yep, yeah, for sure. So, yeah. so your role during disaster. So again, we talked about we're going to have routine meetings and briefings and updates for you. Um, and so each of those people. So I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So in an emergency operations center, you have you have several sec sections, they're called. There's operations, that's this. There's operations, there's logistics, there's finance, there's all of those. You may activate or use all of them or, or just one of them or none of them. So each one of those sections have different responsibilities and different things that you do. So, and I'll give an example of the last fire situation that you uh, had here. Um, we, we didn't activate the EOC per se, but they brought all the staff in to help out. Um, ideally, these kinds of things run in 12-hour cycles. So you plan for just what you need this 12 hours. Somebody else is planning for the next 12 and so on and so forth. At the end of those cycles is your goals. And those can be established by you after getting briefings from us as to what's going on. What are your priorities? So here's your goal out here, your priority. And then logistics and operations and all those other sections work together to figure out what we need in each 12 hour cycle to get to that goal. So in like the fires, 
Um, ideally, you would bring in half your staff in that first 12 hours. So the other half is the other half can stay at home and be on call. And then you bring them, tell them they're reporting at the end of that 12 hour cycle. So that other group can go home or get some rest. So you have these cycles of 12. So in the emergency operations center, which the um, primary one is at the, the second floor of the police department, um, each section has a box like this. This is operations. There are different color coded positions. So we can see who's who in the zoo, right? Because it's going to be a zoo. We also have some pens and paper and stuff in case we don't have any power. And then each section checklist of the things that as soon as we activate the emergency operations center, I'm going to say, okay, your operations. And this is going to be you guys, just FYI. It's going to be my staff or whoever we bring. So the operations chief can sit down and say, here's my checklist. The first thing I need to do is obtain an, a briefing from the incident commander. I'll give them a briefing. Here's where we're at. And then they'll determine the objectives and so on and so forth. So each section has one of these specific to them. There's also a computer, a laptop in there for each section. And if we have power and we can use them, they can bring them up. The same checklist is right on the dashboard. So all they have to do is turn the computer on. That checklist will pop up and then they can start start that position and start getting organized for what we need. Do you there, guys have generators? At the we do. Yeah. yeah. And it's dual powered, fuel powered. So that's handy. So we'll be having regular meetings there in those 12 hour cycles, like probably halfway through and at the end. So maybe every six hours. Uh, depending on the situation. So your participation in those so that you can get updates and know what's happening, go on um, and address what those goals might look like. And we can guide each other through that process and what those goals might want to be. Because what you're thinking might not be, okay, but before we do that, maybe we should do this or vice versa. Um, trust us. Trust us. I know it's hard, but trust that some of us have been trained enough. We'll, we'll, we're, we're going to do our best. That's for sure. And then coordinating those messages, like I talked about, that one voice is really important so that we don't cause panic and confusion. Go here. No, go here. <laughs> right? We don't want that. All right. Next one for me. And so your role after disaster. So after every one of these, we should be meeting and saying what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to do different? How can we prevent this from happening again? All of those things. So how do we be a more resilient community next time? I'm sure you guys all learned stuff after the fires about what worked well and what didn't, maybe what, what we should have been done differently um, and maybe what we'll do differently next time. Uh, so that kind of input would be super important. And then you're going to have to spend some money at some point in up, updating your emergency operations stuff, making sure we stay on top of the electronics and the needs and the communication abilities. We Did you guys know we own a ham radio? So when we built the Sandy Police Department, we had it pre-wired for a ham radio station. We have a big portable one. And it just screws in and the antennas are on the top. So <clears throat> it, I found it over there labeled emergency operations mobile kit. Okay, it wasn't that. We used to have a head count <laughs> of how many ham radio operators we had. So the there's area. there's still, still a there's still a uh, organization called Aries or Aris, mm -hmm. and they're in Clackamas County. Mm -hmm. And so there are still there's one here local. Mm -hmm. Um it's I don't know how much we're gonna actually get out of that as as the years progress. Um, it's kind of a dying industry, but if we have it now. And if we need it, we can certainly access it. I think I have one or two nerds over there too. Mm -hmm. So that could help us with that. They can be kind of handy. Yeah. And then um, again, the communication piece with your constituents, making sure that they get prepared for the next one. They don't get caught flat footed and just coordinating response. Um, Trust, confidence, those kinds of things are going to be important. Here's what the emergency operations plan says about your role. So you'll see under the general responsibilities, establish an emergency management authority by city ordinance. You have one, it needs to be updated. So that's what we're going to do next. So you'll be okay there. Adopt an EOP. That's what we're doing tonight, hopefully, or the next, next 
council meeting. So you're going to be okay there. And then you're going to, you're going to have the authority to declare a state of emergency for the city of Sandy. There is a form. It's a very simple thing. There is a form you, you guys will talk about it and agree or disagree to do it. And then there's a form. It just gets filled out, signed by the mayor. A copy goes to the county. Um, there's a software called Web EOC. They're changing it next month. But Web EOC basically is uh, on the screen. It shows all of the communities in Clackamas County, all the cities, you know, Happy Valley, all of those. And then as our situation is changing, we can update what we're doing on that that. Uh, website. And we can declare an emergency on there, show that we've declared an emergency. We just send a copy to the county. And that shows the county then how many cities in the county have declared an emergency. And we might be the first or we might not ever. Everybody else, we might be the banana belt and we're saved, right? Um, so can be Malala, all of them declare, enough of them declare, the county will then declare an emergency for the county. And then when enough of those declare emergencies in the in the state, then the government, the governor will declare with the federal government. So Web EOC is really a cool thing. The next one's supposed to be even better. I can request officers, I can request dump trucks, I can request snow plows, I can request whatever I want. And another city can say, hey, I've got an extra one, I'm sending it to you. Or they can say, hey, we're short on cops. I got two that aren't doing anything, I'll send them over to you. So it's a really neat software that allows for that instant communication between all of the communities in Clackamas County. So that's how you declare a state of emergency. Um, and it's just, there are some criteria for reimbursement, but I don't want you to get caught up on that because those are moving targets a lot of times depending on the incident. But for example, 400 homes need to be severely damaged or completely destroyed for some reimbursement on housing things. But you can still declare an emergency even if we don't hit those numbers. And an emergency is gonna be, we're overwhelmed. We don't, we're out of resources, we're overwhelmed, we're sinking, send help, right? Who best to decide what that is other than the people managing the emergency? Questions so far? I know I'm feeding you like with a fire hose right now. Um, and then acting as a liaison through the activation of the emergency operations center. So again, getting with your constituents, helping us get the word out, what it is that uh, we need to do. And then also working with other governmental agencies, talking to the people at the state level, talking with your counterparts at the next city over or at the county and helping us get done what we need done. Um, and then acting on emergency funding needs. So more likely than not, if we were to activate the EOC right now, he would be my finance section chief because that makes the most sense as our finance person also. Um, and this is what we need. Now we need money for this or we need to go buy whatever it is that we need that we don't have in stores uh, and we need it now. A lot of times you'll see this for food and water for like the people working the people at the EOC, um, maybe we need tents, maybe we need porta potties, stuff like that. And we need funding for that. In the previous one that I was involved with, the windstorm and all, mm -hmm. um, the difference between that one and what it sounds like this one is, is well, we didn't need a quorum. All we needed was a representative. By that time, it was the mayor and the city manager. And um, I think it was the meeting's chief at that time. I don't remember which might have been the public works, but we didn't need a quorum. Would we need a quorum to decide uh, funding changes, expenditures, um, allocation of resources and stuff? Or does it, does yes, but if it on, I right? think that, and I'll have to get that an answer for you for sure, but I think that there's, so a quorum of this versus there's only three of you, Available. A, a, a quorum of that. I think that's how it is, but I'll double check on that for you. Because at, at that time, again, this has got to be 10 years ago, it was just Bill and I. Yeah, it was before I was here, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then ten, attending the PIO briefings, particularly, you know, the mayor, uh, the mayor pro tem, 
Um, but it doesn't hurt if if you've ever seen this on the news, I'm sure you have, where they have a big deal. I mean, we could activate this for an active shooter, right? Okay. The, that's going to out that's going to exceed our our resources really quickly. So getting you guys standing there, a united front, it instills confidence for our citizens, reduces the panic. You're up there. One or two of you might want to have something to say. Stay on message, please. Um, you might have something you want to say just to help calm the situation. Um, but like, you know, talking about the quorum thing, it just dawns on me. Rich, you might not, you can't come, right? You're probably going to be tied up with Happy Valley or trying to address those concerns. So I'll find out on the quorum thing. But anyway, um, getting standing up there. And just being the calm in the storm for people is incredibly important. Okay, I think that's the last one. That's pretty much your role, the the before, during, and after. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have or concerns that you might have. Do y'all have a radio <clears throat> a radio system that is you know in case the cell phone towers go down? Ye Go ahead. Well, Public Works has um, their radios so they can all communicate with each other. Police obviously have their radios. Yeah. Um, I don't have a radio. Can they communicate to each other? Um, we cannot them. talk to Public Works, but what we would likely do is give them an extra radio and or have Jenny stand in the in the EOC with me so she can radio and talk to her people and I can do the same generally. And then uh, I mean, let's say we have no ability to communicate anyway in, in any form or fashion, then you can start doing things like message boards are located here, here, and here for updates. You can send runners out. Yeah, I'm just more in the yeah. internal part of the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, we, we have radios, but they don't communicate, but we can overcome that by being together and directing our folks from one place. Same with fire. And the, I mean, having some extra radios that then you could, you know, kind of wouldn't hurt. No, uh, that's the wouldn't hurt. The need. You you need to have one. And, yeah. I know. mean, the other thing I would add is that um, all the department heads are on the first net phone system. So in theory, if at and first net system is working, we have mm -hmm. priority over all their phone calls that are coming in through their network. Mm -hmm. um, although I have two phones and it seems like one of them never mm -hmm. works and one of them does and it doesn't matter. It, it's not a consistent service from Verizon or at and um, but, you know, we do have some of those proactive measures in place, too. So any sort of preemption and priority we can have is that, that other one. And I have to keep bringing it up, but because everybody was wondering what their friends were doing, uh, the system was loaded down. So if you're talking about mm -hmm. cell phone kind of mm -hmm. uh, backup, that's that may not be the best. If they're all talking to each other and they overload the system. Well, that first net, though, it it kicks them all off the system and makes okay. these phones priority so yeah first net in theory is supposed to say your that's police, what it's supposed fire, to do. emergency operations emergency management yeah. you get priority so if there's okay. two calls competing it's going to drop this other one and let this other emergency operations in theory in theory yeah supposedly no. yeah uh first of all thanks for doing this this is a lot and, and in full disclosure i didn't get through it all I don't, uh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did get through a fair chunk of it. And so awesome. uh, the, the questions I have though is specifically like, I, I kind of feel like um, if we if we make this then we truly have to implement it. And so when I go to 6.2, which is the training program, mm -hmm. um, I'll note in there that it, it states a couple things that I was wondering. Once that we uh, exercise these, um, this program twice a year that we're training. And are we doing that as a, as a, as a rule. Um, and then the second question, I'll throw it out there as well, is it lists the minimum training requirements uh, to where all personnel, I mean, all personnel is ICS 100 and NIS 1700, but all, when you get up to first responder, you start getting into the one and two and then all the way to mm -hmm. the sevens. Um, and that. So what I'm curious is, do we have a shortfall of training that needs to be conducted uh, not just maybe at the police department, but as the city level. And second, are we actually implementing this and conducting the twice a year operations? And if 
if that's unre uh, unobtainable for whatever reason, maybe we need to look at changing that and making it so that we do fit within that mold. Yeah. So when we implemented this originally, yes, we were meeting all of those benchmarks. Um, and those twice a year things can be as simple as a desktop exercise. It doesn't have to be, you know, onerous. Um, and we were also doing all of that training. And I know that the police department all have one, two, seven, eight around there. Most of us also have three and four hundreds. Um, and then that was a requirement for the department heads too, back when I initially wrote, wrote that. Um, and they were all at that level. Um, but we have fallen behind and it needs to be brought back up. Is there a way that we could get like a what that costs so that we can make sure that we budget for that in the near future? Yeah, all the ICS trainings it's are free. On, most of it's online now yeah. and free. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll just reiterate what Chief said. So um, at one point, all the department heads had the minimum training. I think there's a couple that don't have that training now, but the majority of the department head level um, does have the required minimum training that they need. Um, I know Public Works has made a real heavy uh, attempt to get all of their folks trained up on all the varying levels of ICS. Uh, you already have talked about police. Mm -hmm. So we do have, we have some gaps for sure, but we are, um, we've been making a more concerted effort in the last six months or so to get people trained up. Um, but yeah, we can, especially going into the next budget process, make sure we identify any of the low hanging fruit, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. that we can easily get implemented um or trainings that we can easily get taken care of and then uh have a better plan in place going forward to make sure that we even at, at one point we even had um and i'm talking to sarah they're still kind of on on board with that but we even did things like library can help out with volunteer and donation management because that's what they do is catalog and keep track of things right so i mean we had a pretty robust system and i think it would be pretty easy to get back there just needs a little shove catch up. And we do currently, I know at least once a year, it might be twice a year, um, PD staff are turning on all the laptops, running all the updates, making sure that everything does start up. Um, so it's not a full blown EOC, but we are taking yeah. the protocol or the steps to make sure that everything is in working order, at least so that mm -hmm. when we do have an event, we know it's going to start up and work well. Um, but some of that equipment's aged and needs to be replaced. We have Greg's a loose on. plan on when we get the next round of new computers for the police department, these tough books can then go into the emergency management um, or emergency operations center and then mm -hmm. recycle those old ones. So we have some, some loose plans for that. I would say that, I don't know, 75% of the EOP we do already, even without ever declaring an emergency, yeah. we're having briefings after an event. Uh, the ice storm is a good example that we had um, just earlier this year. Mm -hmm. Um, we had an all management meeting shortly thereafter to talk about what worked, what didn't work, what was great, what do we need to work on next time. Um, so, I mean, just because we haven't updated the plan for a number of years doesn't mean we aren't yeah. taking a proactive response and, and doing much of the work that's in the plan. So I just want to make sure we yeah. highlight that as well. That the, a lot of the work does get done and, and um, but we just need to kind of take that next step in ensuring that we have all those pieces in place and all the protocols ready to go for the next. And year. this was the first big step to that. Yeah, just absolutely. getting this updated. Yeah, that and the natural hazards mitigation plan. Yep. Mm -hmm. so two quick questions. Yes, ma'am. One, do we have, because I didn't get through the whole thing either, but I did get through quite a bit. Not the first time I've read one of these. Yeah. So um, and they all look the same. Yeah, they, they do. They really do. Yeah. Do we have a predetermined rally point in the event of no phone service, no internet? Police part. Okay, that's kind of what I figured. Yeah. And then uh, this is probably really more of a question for you, Tyler, because I do know that we used to do a lot of tabletop mm -hmm. uh, stuff, but, and I know there's been some changes, obviously, police chief changes, fire department changes and whatnot, but where do we stand with like some of our community partners? Because like a lot of these events will require some partnership potentially with the school district for mm -hmm. infrastructure, busing, different things like that. Yeah. So, um, where do we stand with some of our community partners and maybe what our expectations may be in the event of an emergency? Yeah, so um, fire chief, superintendent, and myself meet monthly. Um, we have had conversations around like, you know, what do we do when the next big thing happens? Whatever that big thing is, we just had lunch was that two weeks ago and we talked about what? we read last, was that last week? week? I think so. All the time. It's all merges together. Yes. 
Uh, I mean, a good portion of that lunch was talking about wildfires in Central Oregon and then rehashing what worked well, what didn't work well, what have we done, what would we do when and if that happens again over here. So, um, I mean, I think those relationships are there. I can, you know, call Aaron, call Nick, sure. whenever, and then have those conversations. Um, Clackamas Fire District and the city's relationship really um, blossomed last August with the Bull Run Fire. Um, and just really opening up that communication and, and staying online with each other throughout that event. So I think the, the relationships are there, the knowing of people, faces, numbers, all of that is there. Um, but having a formal like, hey, let me come and step into your tabletop that you're doing or, hey, come and step into our tabletop hasn't happened. Before. Well, I will say that um, so the Oregon Trail School District's got a really robust program. They're very they're very organized and, and ready to go. And we used to exercise with them quite a bit. I think we even brought fire over once and and did an I evacuation. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. And then, um, and I know that they're wanting me to come back and work on a few things with them mm -hmm. in conjunction with this too. So uh, the relationships are definitely there. Um, where I think we could probably take that next level is with some of our uh, nonprofits or community groups, uh, Kiwanis or whoever, and start getting their help in getting other people in the community um, organized and ready for an, an, an emergency, especially our elderly. Yeah. And also our nursing homes, we need to make sure we have plans in place with them and mm -hmm. things of that nature. I will add too that uh, historically there's been a lot of handshake agreements with contractors who maybe have heavy machinery or equipment mm -hmm. that we would need to use, but not formal agreements. Yeah, Jenny's already um, been in the early stages of reaching out and trying to formalize those agreements. So we have a standard rate, we have a standard contact contact person, mm -hmm. um, it's standard scope of work. So we're not getting jerked around, you know, for lack of a better term, when the event happens. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we're taking steps to, to formalize all of that as well. And then we have the IGAs in place with neighboring communities in Clackamas County for the employee swaps. So, oh, hey, you, you know, your public work staff are, well, most of ours live locally, but let's say they all lived in Gresham and something's wrong with the highway. Hey, Gresham, you go ahead and use our people, but we've got three people from mm -hmm. Malala that live out here or SDK that live out here. We're going to take theirs. And so we have, um, that already in place yeah. as well. So we with police too. Yeah. 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 We have that in place with police too. Yeah. Yep. Do we have that relationship with the county EOC? Are we participating in their yes. activities yeah. and all of that? I I would say it's not as um, robust of a relationship as far as picking up the phone and just kind of you well, know reaching the person that I so, want or need to talk to. You know to. Cheryl Bledsoe. So Cheryl Bledsoe and I grew up over in Washington together in in EMS. So <laughs> yeah, there's some relationships there. Um, so my question is because we've had, you know, with the Bull Run fires um, and but also the, you know, the Clackamas fires and all. Um, and the fact that we're so we're kind of the big town closest to the Valley yeah. National Forest, we're the kind of the logical point where they would, um, you know, base their EOC like, you know, that's what they the headquarters, Fortune's headquarters mm -hmm. was the EOC for the fires and stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's not that much, hardly any mention in this of. Um, you know, um, the Mountain National Forest, mm -hmm. the fire, uh, the feet fire management officer, um, the uh, supervisor, forest supervisor, mm -hmm. just having some mm -hmm. of those kind of contacts in there, it would be really helpful. The, um, I'm a little bit still confused about, you know, when it's something like that, where it's not exactly in, a, in Sandy, but it's threatening Sandy or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, they're taking the lead on it, but we're obvious, you know, and, and that worked pretty well with the bull run and yeah, you know, there was a lot of communication and all. I'm just kind of mm -hmm. wanting to make sure that kind of stuff that happened really well happens again. And I know some of it is we would be uh, interacting more with the county sheriff and the um, Clackamas County fire folks who are then working with forest yeah. service right. and all that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We would be a resource to the county if if necessary, if they had like, for example, law enforcement needs and and they were what would more likely happen as they're trying to address evacuations or things up there, we might likely find ourselves back filling for them a little bit, uh, like calls in the area around us or some some things like that. Yeah. Um, that's a distinct possibility. Um, but also what what's 
what happens in those situations, they bring their, you know, incident command teams from all over the place, and they don't really know the local politics, not even politics, just the local uh, contacts, and, you know, who needs to know, and mm -hmm. where a good place to post this would be, and things like that, and so having that kind of interaction, sure, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know that much about Clackamas County folks, uh, and how familiar they are with Sandy either, so, you know, obviously Sandy Fire was, mm -hmm. but um, well, the said, Japanese know us pretty well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, talking about the fires um, last year at this time or last August, uh, I don't know what magic happened behind the scenes, but several people got my phone number. Um, I had, you know, random numbers from like Utah, New Jersey, all, uh, um, I can't think of the, the um, incident command team where they were stationed from now. Um, They're from Utah, I think. They were the Great, Basin. Uh, Great Basin team. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, you know, random calls at 11 o'clock at night. Hey, do you know anyone that has a helicopter or know the local airport contact information so that we can, you know, talk to them. So those, even without having some of those relationships, yeah. they, they naturally, they know someone that knows someone. It's not a foolproof, you know, no. recipe, but I mean, those, those phone calls get made, that yeah. phone tag happens and yeah. we're able to supply them the information they need. And that's kind of what I was, the next thing I was on my list, it was kind of like a, having a phone list as part of the mm -hmm. appendix. And of course it could be private and not subject to public records or anything, but you know, it, it's most important for you all to have it in between yourselves. But you know, if Jenny's not there, does, you know, does everybody have Ryan's number and, and you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a good just idea. being able to not only just, you know, your staff, but also the other contacts at the county mm -hmm. and, you know, it because people's positions change and oh, yeah. that guy was, you know, here four years ago and, you know, his that's, you know, so you get this cell phone and he's, you know, gone long gone yeah. type of stuff. Um, but then also having these contacts for, you know, contractors or whatever it is, um, they anybody probably... we have an agreement with for sure yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so, uh, and then like i said the um uh, emergency operations center so is the you know my experience because i've been um uh the public information officer for a whole bunch of different events but do do you have enough room there or yeah so the way we have it designed is um the uh, if you will recall upstairs on the second floor, we have a training training room and then that can be set up for these different sections. Mm -hmm. And then across is a big conference room. So we can put several, like if we're doing a JIC with a, like a bunch of PIOs from different agencies, they can all go in there mm -hmm. or an executive team can go in there. And then all of the offices along the perimeter can also be used for those too. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, my experience is that, it's really helpful to have plotters and things like that because you want to be able to yeah. print off 11 by 17 and some bigger maps and things like that for briefings and all. And so just having, do you guys have a plotter? We don't. We would yeah. rely on over, over here. here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which, okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just the comment about the radios and just making sure that, you know, we have some yep. extras that you guys can kind of uh, share. Just um, mm -hmm. that's been helpful. Yep. Good job on it. Really thorough. Thank uh, you. In reference to having a long list of numbers, I'm just thinking to myself, I guess I, as a council, I would be concerned about somebody from Utah calling up Ryan and saying to Ryan, you know, we need to have piece equipment and it needs to be shipped tomorrow morning and without going through the appropriate finance. And no, understanding. That's, that would be so, how that would work. But well, that's the thing I was thinking of is yeah, you a long list have of just people who are talking to people within our organization so they have the authority to commit equipment money and that kind of stuff fine if they don't then make sure we have the right people yeah we can be able to make those decisions so i think in in that scenario he's talking about people come in from all over when there's a fire right mm -hmm. and those people came here from utah to work our fire so it wasn't people in utah well, I just thought I heard Tyler say he got somebody phone call. Yeah. Like the yeah, area they're, 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 they're here. They're here working our yeah. fire, but Contacts. they came to help us. Yeah. But yeah, totally. Yeah. We all want to do what we can to make things go fast. Yeah. Possible. But I have been in some places before when we had to go back and review and find out that somebody allocated money, oh, spent sure. equipment, lost equipment that they shouldn't have. So, yeah. Yeah. We can't throw everything out that's not legally required, even right. in an emergency. There are that's some right. things 
you can't have set aside. That's right. Temporarily, and I remember right, we, how you finance certain things that are not allocated to yep. the budgetary system if it's needed. We don't be able to buy that piece of equipment if we need to and so on. Yep. There are some, some rules that just can't be. Well, and ideally we'll have one of our attorneys on speed dial with us while we're <laughs> navigating this and getting some advice when we can. Got it. Yeah. Any other questions, you guys? Great. Well, we'll take some of this feedback that we got tonight. And I appreciate we'll, it, your time. Um, and, you know, I think an updated phone tree, we have a phone tree for internal contacts, but it hasn't been updated in a while. I think that's a great um, well, comment for us mm -hmm. to make sure we have all the updated contact information. And there. I will say that Web EOC system had availability to do that for you okay. and to hold the MOUs, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm anxious to see what this new one does. Okay. So it's also helpful to just have a um, index of who's got what of the training, you know, when yep. the different yeah, we used to have that somewhere. because that stuff, you know, it's yeah. like I always forgot how often I had to do it and all. And so just yep. getting, you know, being able to kind of review that, oh, I got to go next year and all. And yeah. I think to your point, that's yeah. there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of little stuff that needs to be like this all the time. And mm -hmm. so an emergency operations person would really be helpful for the city. And again, they could be assigned other tasks in between. I mean, I think, you know, the recent past has shown us that emergency incidences are just going to continue to happen more frequently, whether, you know, severity is going to change, right? But they happen often. Mm -hmm. um, and so to that point, you know, mm -hmm. this stuff isn't going away, right? There's going to be more and more forest fires with the drier the climate is. There's going to be more and more severe winter weather storms. We've seen those over the last couple of years. So continuing to make sure that we have an updated document, relevant contact info, good policies and procedures in place is going to be imperative to navigating those we, situations. we could even activate all of this stuff and and have done to in various degrees for missing children or missing mm -hmm. adults or things of that nature just to get us organized and mm -hmm. get all our resources together mm -hmm. so it doesn't even have to be anything that yeah. dramatic that's a good point thank you thank you thank you all right sweet thanks okay. so much yeah. uh so we'll uh do you have something Else, you no, I'm good. Okay, I thought you would have some. Sorry. Yep, no, you're good. Uh, so we'll adjourn and how about we be back at 7 05? That's good. Okay. All right, I'll call the city council meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible and liberty and justice for all. All right. Jeff, would you uh, proceed with the roll call, please? Yes, Councillor Maiden, present. Councillor Sheldon, here. Councillor Walker, here. Councillor Exner, here. Councillor Hokinson, excused. Uh, Council President Smallwood, here. And uh, Mayor Pulliam. Uh, I wasn't aware he was going to be gone, excused. but Tyler, Tyler oh. says he's. Here, he's excused. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, any changes to the agenda? None? Okay. Um, public comments? Do we have anything online? Nothing online. Okay. Mr. Castle, you're up. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> well, I'm here again. <laughs> Uh, my name's Doug Castle. Address is 16200 Bell Street. Uh, we're located at the east end of the project and on the north side, lots of trees, seven about seven acres. It's like an unrefined mining park. Um, this is concerning the resolution from April, resolution 2024-08, Bell Street Advanced Financing Rebirth District. A uh, couple concerns. Number one is the most pressing right now, I think. Um, and I don't know if these can be amended resolutions. But the map used to determine the developable acreage was not the right map to use for that. Um, case in point, the map, I'll refer to it as map A, was utilized by uh, Epic Land Solutions about a year and a half ago. Uh, to de determine the parcel values for the purpose of the city negotiating for easement acquisitions. Uh, 
for the Bell Street project. Uh, EPIC at that time determined that the wetland constraint for my parcel, the seven acres, was 2.97 acres. Uh, map B is the map that was utilized for putting together this reimbursement district. And the city staff determined that from that map that the wetland constraint for my parcel was three one hundredths of an acre. Um, I saw those that figure uh, the day of the second meeting um, at the meeting because I was very concerned about why it was three hundredths of an acre. Um, AJ visited my property about a month ago and agreed that um, map B, the current one, should not have been used to, de to determine that and that the difference due to the city at development would be about $80,000 at the beginning. And if you compounded over 20 years, it'd be 160000 difference. Um, while my parcel is probably the most affected by this, uh, a couple, three of the others would also be impacted. <clears throat> uh, second concern, Epic Land Solutions at that time, a year and a half ago, also determined that about half of my developable acreage is zoned R2, and the other half on the east side of the stream is zoned SFR, single family residential. Uh, three of the six properties, the large ones are zoned light industrial, well, three of the smaller properties uh, are zoned residential, and half of mine is single family. And yet, all six properties would be contributing $25,000 plus per acre of developable land. And the third concern is concerning the moratorium, a uh, five year moratorium. I'm assuming that the moratorium would go from April 15th, 2024 to April 15th, 2029, is my understanding. Is that true? I'm not sure which five-year reference you're... The moratorium. The moratorium is only effective in six-month increments, not to exceed two years. Um, so, yeah, we can stop. We need to go back and look at what dates you're referencing. To okay, I, I'm, I'm not understanding then what that okay. moratorium is. So if there's a moratorium, the advanced financing, financing district, which is 20 years, is that correct? Would go from what date to what date? That I'm not clear on what that would, how the moratorium would affect that. Does that start back in April or does that wait until the moratorium is over and then start? Uh, related to that, when does the annual 5% interest begin to accumulate <laughs> now? Or if the district starts five years from now, does it start to accumulate then? So there's some questions that I had about timelines. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do some research and yep. follow back up. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. Yep. All right. Consent agenda. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I move that we approve the consent agenda as it is written. Second. I'll second. second. Okay. Um, I have a, a motion by Councillor Exner and a second by uh, Councillor Maiton. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? I'm going to abstain. I wasn't here. So fair enough. Very good. All right. New business. So mining memorial park improvements. Okay. I'm gonna make that. You're ready. Go okay. ahead. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, Council. Thank you for this opportunity to be here this evening to speak with you about another project that the Park and Recreation Department is about to embark on, one we've been looking forward to. Um, and we'll be working with Lango Hansen and collaborating on this project. So Brian is with me tonight. And then Tiana, a vested interest in our park project, who has been helping, is also here and, and can help answer questions. Um, so first, we just want to talk about this stage in the process. This is one of many meetings that we'll bring to the council and before the Parks Board. And I just wanted to explain a little bit of why that we're here. So in 2011, there was plans that were created to renovate mm -hmm. Meinig Park. And then those were worked on and it went out to bid in 2017. And then the project stalled a bit. It was on pause. And so we're looking forward to revitalizing those efforts. 
And furthermore, the Parks and Trails Master Plan also calls out mining improvements as a tier one um, priority. And so we're taking a look at that based on the master plan and the guidance of that. Um, furthermore, the council in the past has mentioned that it is a goal to um, renovate and improve Minick Park. It is one of our cherished assets because it is one of two community parks that this community has. The second one is currently being developed. So we'd like to um, focus on Minick. And we've got some really large events there that um, we want to improve as far as the, the access, the ADA accessibility, the paths, the stream restoration. So we're pretty excited to uh, start this process. And tonight, we really want the council's feedback regarding the focus areas. If there's anything that you want us to add, take a closer look at, that's really the goal for tonight. And then we will be back in front of you again with refined options and, of course, uh, different touch points throughout this process. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Brian. Thank you. So, and I'll share my screen here. Yeah, and we're again, we're really excited to be here tonight. And as Rochelle alluded to, this is really a listening session. We don't have designs for these focus areas yet. Tonight is more confirming the work that's been done to date, making sure they're on target for these focus areas, and as well as if we're missing any, any areas that we should be giving attention to. So first, the next slide is just a little orientation for the park that's right behind us down the hill, about 10 and a half, just a little over 10 and a half acres mining park is um, the current community park, as Rochelle alluded to, along with Cedar Park under construction. So similar size, both of those. A well-loved uh, park, I think originally constructed in the mid 60s, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, just this plan showing here, uh, starting closest to us, North is to the left, City Hall, just the very edge of the screen, the informal parking lot that's right at the edge of the property line there, with the, the trail system shown in white, heading down to, yeah, the, the larger parking lot off of Mining Avenue there. And then in purple, that number six is the Fantasy Forest. The blue ribbon that bisects the site there is No Name Creek, which we'll be touching on. There's the main stage there shown in green. Uh, restrooms number seven, kind of central to the site there. And then the other amphitheater number eight. Uh, and then the, the shelter below it there, number three. Mm -hmm. And then to the, um, the right side, the large uh, open semi-mature forest there for the right southern third of the site. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why that went backwards. Okay. So I think Michelle's already given a pretty good um, background of some of the planning efforts that have taken place with the original documents that started in uh, 2011, leading up to 2017, but ultimately for a couple of reasons were tabled. We're really looking to breathe some life into those, uh, key into some of the focus areas. Um, not really a master plan effort, but keying into key areas that we can uh, improve in the park for both maintenance and some reconstruction. In the Parks and Trails master plan that came out that was released in 2022, there were several areas that were outlined as improvements for um, the park itself, uh, including Fantasy Forest, the condition of the playground itself, while the deteriorating in need of significant maintenance there. Some of the, the pathways uh, both falling apart and not meeting ADA standards. Um, and then various other, the excuse me, the erosion at the creek, fixing that, and signage and some other specific elements that we'll get into moving forward. So as, as you keep alluding to, here are, here's a map that shows the five focus areas, starting um, with number one, it, it is No Name Creek and reestablishing the banks that are currently eroding from top to bottom on there as it travels through the site. Number two is looking, focusing in on Fantasy Forest and the improvements there, given that it's about uh, just under 30 years ago that that was installed. Um, number three, being just the orange color delineating the trails and pathway system throughout the entirety of the site. Number four, one thing that was included in that previous uh, planning study and the documentation was a, a dog park on the southern end of the site. And then number five being some hillside seating immediately adjacent to the main stage. 
So we'll jump into each of these and talk a little bit more specifically um, of each of those. This is here a plan view of the originally constructed fantasy forest, um, the playground there. And just looking at the, the playground today, walking the site and talking with park staff. So there's really four, four different key areas that came out at, um, of the, the conditions of the playground itself right now. So it's a wooden structure, top to bottom, almost every, besides the metal fasteners, everything about it's wood with the metal slides. It's seen a lot of sun and rain and weather over the years, and park staff has been doing quite a bit of maintenance over the past many years to keep it up and running, but it is really at the end, or it could be said past the end of its usable lifespan and really in need of some significant re repair replacement. It ultimately, uh, you know, being built 25, 30 years ago does not meet current ADA standards in terms of access to the play features. Um, it's, it's worth pointing out the amount of money that is put into just the maintaining of the structure that's at the end of its life. And lastly, this ties in directly with the ADA. It's not just meeting, not meeting the ADA standards, but it's not inclusive in terms of meeting the needs of the, the entire community and, and folks of all abilities. How would you be inclusive um, and, and what parameters are you talking about? Talk about age and besides ADA? Yeah, so ADA is kind of the baseline of, of it's more of a mobility standard okay. so that people with physical abilities can get to all parts of the playground. But the sure. inclusivity is really providing a broad range of experiences for all developmental abilities. So whether it's cognitive or physical or any type of Excellent. so that okay. everybody can fully access the playground. Um, these are just a series of images that really start to highlight the, the condition of, of the wood and of the playground itself. Some of the maintenance that's been done over the years and some of the condition of, of those wood frames. And I'm sure Tiana could provide us with plenty of stories of things that have needed to be repaired and do need to be repaired. This has been extensively outlined in some analysis that's been conducted of the play structure itself, but just to help familiarize everybody with the current conditions there. Moving on to No Name Creek, um, this over the years has cut a deeper channel, probably mostly through the heavier winter flows as there's um, runoff coming through that part of the creek. So looking at reestablishing the banks, planting, bringing in other um, types of physical improvements that would shore up those banks as well to improve the conditions, reestablish the habitat, and ultimately provide a better experience in the park there. The pathway and trail systems. Um, currently, there are, I would say, a majority of the pathways throughout the site are not ADA compliant, both in their slopes and some of the transitions. They also don't really uh, fully meet the maintenance needs for uh, the needs of maintenance vehicles. They're more constructed to a pedestrian level, so it, it makes it difficult for maintenance vehicles to get to all parts of the park. Um, we touched on on the south end of the site, the, the previous set of plans showed the potential of an off-leash dog park. So that it showed a fenced area. I think it was about a half acre in size. Um, there's there's a long list of opportunities and constraints here that we, we developed just to, to help us to think through the implications of, of putting an um, off-leash dog park on this site. It is um, heavily forested at this point. So there's there is the space, but there is the constraint of the trees, which does provide shade, which is good, but also limits visibility, particularly during evening hours. It's really centrally located in the site, so there's not a lot of eyes on to it from any part of the perimeter of the site. Um, and we can go into some of the more specifics if we want to in the discussion on that. Hillside seating, this is adjacent to the main theater. One of the uh, improvements that was touched on, developed in that plan was across, on the uh, north side of No Name Creek, providing some formalized seating there so that people can come, sit down, and not just have to throw a blanket on the, the side of the slope, but providing more comfortable seating, helping also ultimately protect the trees from uh, over uh, compaction of their roots. That's That is it. That is yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So we've presented these five areas. Um, wanted to bring them to the group tonight, to council tonight, get feedback if these are 
uh, the five focus areas that we should be focusing on, if, if there's other areas in addition to that that we should be focusing on. And just real quick before we um, open it up to comments, uh, one of the things that we did meet with the Parks Board last week to mm -hmm. discuss this, and um, just a quick summary of how that meeting went so this group is aware, there were two items that they wanted to add to the focus area. One was parking. And so um, that's something that Lingo Hansen um, is, will incorporate um, based on Parks Board feedback. And then the other one was neighborhood access. And so one of the things we've noticed with the large events is a delineation between when the public enters and accesses the park. So instead of boulders like a bollard um, at the entrance off of, oh, I can never remember what that street is over here to the uh -huh. east. Yeah. And just so making a, a clear definition with, with bollards that would help us with vehicles coming in and out, keeping the public out, separating um, the events and activities here. So they wanted to see that as a focus. And then um, one of the things that they, they summarized the, the creek restoration path. And then one of the things that fell to the bottom of the list was the discussion about the dog park. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so one, so I was involved in the 2011 and the 2017 plan. Um, and there, this parking lot up here on the uh, left side was scheduled to be improved for parking. Is that, I mean, it doesn't have a number on it. Was that, it's on those. Yeah, I think that falls into what Rochelle was mentioning about the, the feedback that came from the parks okay. board is, yeah. is uh, looking at yeah. um, so formalizing did, that. Yeah. I mean, it, it is striped, but making that a more direct connection. Yeah. And What we did um, back in 2011 is, you know, we kind of planned for um, different, uh, well, even before that, we in, 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 um, in the, late 90s, early 2000s, we planned for the, you know, the gazebo and the um, amphitheater and all those kind of things. And then, you know, obviously we ran out of money at, and but the parking lot also got put in. So what we've kind of been doing is trying to kind of look at what can we do and where do we get the money? So um, rather than kind of doing another conceptual plan, we wanted to really, you know, those, you kind of do those and then you have to kind of spend a lot of money to get the actual, uh, you know, blueprints to be able to kind of give to a contractor to run with it. And so we put together a plan in 2016 that identified, um, we had a lot of stuff in there and we couldn't afford everything. So we had to take a lot of stuff out. Um, but exactly like they said, um, redoing the trail system, it did not have fantasy forest in there because at that point, I think fantasy forest wasn't that bad off. Um, but what it did have is it had um, a, a picnic shelter down there um, to the right of fantasy forest in that kind of clearing. And it also had one of the things that um, I've heard from a lot of folks <clears throat> over time, but we had talked about having a kind of an in, excuse me, in bank slide down from fantasy forest down towards the parking lot, kind of like trying to get your kids to get finally go. And it's like, okay, one last time down the slide <laughs> nice. and that's it, you know, and so kind of, in, in, yeah. But also then having a bathroom down there because obviously the, you know, we have had a port potty, but, um, you know, trying to get over to the flush toilets and stuff with a little kid is pretty impossible. So those were again, outside of our cost, uh, <laughs> arena but um again having a picnic shelter down there and a and a small you know even just having a, a cxt toilet or something like that um was mentioned um that parking lot improving that so that pre provided more uh adequate parking and so what they did is they did go in there and do surveys and all that oh uh, the in-bank scene can you go to that last slide that you showed and we've all been to those concerts okay so up at the top picture there you can kind of see how it's just all muddy off to the lower left and then it's all muddy you know it's another muddy hill going behind the people sitting in the chairs there in the pink and the blue shirts you know and so and that you know you can't Tiana could probably verify this you really can't keep any grass on there because people are just walking straight down the fall line that's about a 25 percent slope at least and so just being able to kind of um figure out places to have some terracing or you know some some just block wall and and flatter areas in there. So it's, so people, and then having a staircase or something in the middle so that people can kind of access down, to, you know, if you want to come down and see your friend by the stage or whatever, um, doing something like that. So that was kind of the intent of that. And then of course the No Name Creek restoration was the goal for that was to, you know, kids want to go down there and play in the creek. And so you want to kind of make it so that they, they don't, you know, make a bigger mess and you kind of you know do that by creating these big flat rock areas where they can kind of get in there safely and not hurt themselves um but then in other areas kind of keep them out like 
you know, we joked about planting devil's club or something like that. So that, you know, we're just making it so vegetated that it really isn't possible for them to get down to the creek and, and denude all the um, streamside area there. So just having, you know, several access points for play, but but then putting some vegetation back there. So that was kind of the, the whole concept. And um, yeah, and so I'm really excited to see this happen. I think, you know, the dog park was something I think was kind of added on. Sarah Richardson was involved there and she was a big dog park person. We didn't have any plans for another dog park at that time. And so, you know, I think it is, you know, maybe you guys have talked about it at your parks board, but um, there is a need to kind of identify, you know, where another dog park might go in town and what, you know, what park fits it best or whatever is big enough or has the parking or whatever it is that you guys want to do. But um, yeah, I can understand why that, you know, like you said, has some visibility issues and things like that. So that, that's kind of just a synopsis of history. So. Carl. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of projects. And I think we're only talking a couple hundred thousand. Is that the budget term I saw in this, yeah, in this biennium, there's two hundred thousand dollars, and um, some of those were for initial capital improvement projects, and then we're wrapping this strategic, like picking the design phase up, and um, so we're hoping to have a strategic approach. Okay, that okay. the list that Kathleen just went through, I'm sure we're well yeah. beyond yeah. anything <laughs> with that. So I, I guess I would be willing to discuss priorities, mm -hmm. which was the most mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. First, second, third, so on. Uh, some things are required by law. Some things are required because of the safety of the fantasy forest. I wasn't involved in constructing it, but uh, at the time I was involved in other places. Uh, but uh, uh, my kids played in there, and now I'm not sure I'd send my grandkids in there. Because <laughs> all of it. So there are some things that really are critical to be able to get, and some things on the list of things we'd all love to see there, we probably should let go for a while until we get some money. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my priority would be, let's prioritize those things. Safety first, legal issues first. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to have more parking spaces, but at this point, um, I think that may be something that we have developed some parking spaces. So um, I love the ideas of the two things that the planning department put on. I think those are good ideas. And, and part of our efforts will be um, cost estimates and working through that and then um we you know obviously don't have the funds for it in this biennium so it'd be one of our endeavors next to when we're planning the next biennium to take a look at sdcs um we're planning on um applying for an oprd grant again um those limits have all gone up so we're already you know trying to think about how are we going to fund this project in the next bi next biennium so maybe we could do all those things on the menu but <laughs> chris the couple of things I was going to say that have already been stated, so I'll just ask my question first. Um, as far as the updating on the um, Fantasy Forest, would the, would the restoration be with replacement wood again, or would be an altered method of material be considered? Does that make sense? What I'm asking? It, it does. I think we would be not replacing the whole thing. <laughs> uh, sorry, say that last part again. You're not replacing the whole thing. Um, I think that is under consideration, just given the state of it's all at that end of it or past the end of its lifespan. And there are other really good alternatives to wood that are going to last that much longer, just given the amount of rain we get here. And all right, well, thank you for answering that. Then I'll, I'll go ahead and just um, repeat what was already said. Uh, I like the direction you're headed. I would move the dark park to the very end. Yeah. It's not a priority for me. Um, the two things that I wanted to see. Um, would be the upper parking lot here behind us that uh, be dramatically improved. And I was talking about the space that's on the lower end, because um, I'm pretty sure that's ours as well. Mm -hmm. That's not striped <laughs> or paved. And then the other is, um, and uh, Councilor Walker mentioned it, um, as raising my daughters in that park, <laughs> there is no bathroom close to, to fantasy and it needs to, I would like to see something there. I think that would be more uh, beneficial to the community. So. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of this has already been said, so I don't want to reiterate. I'm, I, I really agree with Chris and Carl. Uh, to the degree, though, I, I would like to see um, the majority, the funding mechanism for this as well, and the specifically around the SDCs and how much can be paid for out of SDC and how we do that um, and what that looks like moving forward. 
that's super important for me. And then because I, I would imagine if we're talking about making the the pathways vehicle compliant, that's got to be um, not cheap. So as much of that can be paid for out of SDCs is where I think it needs to come from. And, and I'd like to see that moving forward. And, and we're fortunate because we have a reimbursement SDC. Mm -hmm. And so where um, this project um, would apply or you could use the SDCs for the reimbursement to pay for the majority of it. So, yes. Yeah. So um, the 200,000, that's general funds, right? That was, oh, go ahead. No, it's part of uh, PARP's SDCs. Mm -hmm. Did, didn't we set aside some money in general funds? No. Um, not for these specific projects. No. There was no. some general fund allocated for uh, some different park improvements. The electrical upgrades that we Thank made you. Yeah. The yes, park. the electrical upgrades that were made to the park to help oh, support yeah. the Winterfest program. Um, but there was not, these updates that are presented in this specific presentation were not part of that allocation of general funds. Um, <clears throat> and that 200,000 that was set aside for Mining Park uh, was really sort of what was available, for lack of a better term, within the existing SDCs that weren't being used for Cedar Park improvements and uh, Deer Point Park. Okay. okay. The reason I ask that is, sorry, sorry Carl, let me just finish my thought, um, is the master plan that we just adopted had a hundred that had um, uh, mining park for tier one, the most important project, you know, was path renovations and creek restoration at a, and it had $100,000 there. Um, and then for tier two, which was the second, then it had another listing for mining memorial park for um, ADA improvements, lighting, trails, dog park, 273,200. And then the tier three was playground renovation for 500,000. So that was kind of the timing and, and and all. And so that's kind of our, you know, fairly recent plan is capital investment plan timing is, are you guys talking about kind of the, changing that up or what? Right. And that's part of the conversation we've been having is a phased approach. And one of the things that's bumped fantasy forest from a tier three, which is, I think that's, what is that 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. out um, is the, the, there's a, an immediate need there. And so we've talked about creative ways to potentially fund that through grants. And so, uh, you know, changing that from a tier three to a one, because um, we're pretty concerned mm -hmm. and we're getting a lot of feedback that there's concerns of safety. So to Carl, uh, Councillor Exner's point with the phased approach, we can present the council with a menu and look at what we have remaining in SDCs and talk about in the next biennium what, what we can afford from this phased approach, but have a plan that we can enact on. Um, over a series of years, if we don't have the SDCs to um, accomplish this project. Okay, well, we had a grant for $675,000 in 2016 from the state for this, for these trails and um, and the projects that I just listed, not the, uh, you know, not the playground and stuff wasn't included. So those trails are treacherous. And it, you know, I rem I mean, you guys probably remember, I mean, the whole Winterfest is a total white hat project. However, the idea that we've got, you know, people walking around on those, you know, the, the crumbling, there's root, roots, you know, buckling them. I mean, it's just a treacherous thing to have them walking around in, in the dark. And so um, the trails have needed to be done for a very long time and have been, in my mind, the top priority to get done to make them more ADA and accessible and safe to walk on. You know, it's a huge safety factor. You know, so that would be if that's number one, then, you know, I can kind of go along with playground being number two, but I, I don't want to ignore. And like I said, we already have bid documents already put together for the trails. So I don't want to have to redo that with so, some new plan. So are, are you suggesting, mm -hmm. just a question, um, are you suggesting or uh, insinuating that you would rather see uh, the kids playground closed? temporarily because of safety issues to put that further down the list i you know i don't think it's a i don't think it's a i don't think you have to close the playground um you know joe preston kind of kept it somewhat you know didn't maintain it that often i'm not saying that you know it doesn't take some additional money and all but my from where i stand what i've heard you say is you know we've already gotten a six hundred seventy five thousand dollar grant 
So I think we can get that again if we're ready to act on it. And um, you know, the problem that we had that we couldn't go forward was because we didn't have, first of all, the bids came in too high because we let it go in like Memorial Day when everybody already had a load of work. And then the second is that we didn't have our STCs allowed to be spent on Mining Park at all. So we couldn't do the match. So I think we can get a grant for the playground stuff. I think, you know, there's a, the ability, you know, with our SDCs to use that for the trails as they as intended. And, you know, I think we can do both. I'm not, and I think it makes sense to do both. You really, you know, to try to do the trails and not the playground and the playground and not the trails is kind of a fool's errand. So can you guys speak to the, to the condition of the playground? Or do you want to, do you want to talk about that? And some of the, That's your the challenges of, <laughs> Playground is in decline. The report that they mention in reference will be eight years old next month. And what is, is that a Leathers report or what? It is, it was from Leathers Playground who built it. They came out, they inspected it. And at that point they were recommending replacement. They say that these playgrounds should last 20 years with proper maintenance and we've attempted proper maintenance that we don't have a lot of staff. We don't have a lot of staff. Mm -hmm. We are trying. Mm -hmm. We are out there all the time. We spent 17 hours on that playground last month doing repairs there. I have product on order that will arrive this Wednesday to try to address some of the drive rot in that playground. We are doing everything we can to keep it going. It is declining faster than we can fix it. I know and after that. When I address yeah. the repairs in the playground, the community is disappointed. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They would love to see it stay in its original state with all the original features, which I would love to do for them. But tires no longer make a safe option for a playground element. Mm -hmm. exactly. And so I go back to the manufacturer and I sh share photos and drawings and show them what I'm facing. And I go off of their recommendation mm -hmm. on how to improve the playground. What can I put in place? And I follow their recommendations and install what they are saying I can legally put in there safely. Yeah, in terms of my, my my mind, I think that the safety is is always number one. So, to me, being able to look at that fantasy forest, it's in the mining park, it's in the plan. I think that's really high on my list. I also think that the trails, uh, certainly recently, I have some very big experience in trying to push around a wheelchair through the park just this past weekend, and well, my goodness. Uh, I was tired, um, and it's it's quite quite the steep slope in several places. And even if you had uh, midterm or mid path flat spaces and so on to give a rest, you don't have any of that. But even at that, uh, I think to me safety is is premium, and uh, I am not willing to spend more money than we already have. So if the grant is there, man, let's go get it. If the grant's not there, we have the money that we have, and we should spend it. And again. I, I'm not going to say that I'm the only one that should specify the priorities there, but Definitely. I think it'd be important for you guys to come to us and say, here's what you think the priorities are. Right. And it just, up to and, a certain number for the dollars that we Right. Have. And just to be clear, today isn't <clears throat> us talking about prioritizing the list. We're, these are our areas of focus because we've identified, you know, as a department, we judge things based on safety, function, and aesthetics. This is a safety concern, all the paths, mm -hmm. the playground. Um, I've learned go big or go home um, with <laughs> Cedar Park. And so our goal is to have the funding and find the funding to make the safety issues addressed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, depending, and too, depending on SDCs and the grants, there's a higher limit for the grants this year. Um, so um, we contemplated not being so conservative, um, especially now that we've had a bunch of grants with OPRD under our belts and we've been successful and on time. So Great. Um, Great. our goal is to do all the focus areas. Yep. Yep. And the last piece that I would like to bring up is, and I'm, I hope you are already considering it, timing. So I don't want the whole park down all summer long. I would imagine we could find segments that we could construct on and let the park, right. it's such a high use park. Everybody wants to be in it, even if it's not during the sounds or the movies or the mountain festival, there's always people in there. Right. So I, I would hate to see more of the park under construction than we really need to be at any one time. 
I think that's a great idea. And I think, you know, watching Cedar Park, it takes a whole, you know, several seasons yeah. to build we'll, it from the we'll ground up, but looking at, you know, replacing pieces of trail, I think we can be very strategic in how we approach that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. One the little, I'll just um, mention that, and again, I'm not, I mean, I don't really have a, a clear uh, preference on playground equipment, but I will tell you Troutdale recently, you know, they had a Leathers playground too that burned up um, Imagination Station and they went to go replace it and they had their parks board. I don't know if you heard this story, probably maybe you did. I read I read a bunch of the parks board meeting minutes and the city council meeting minutes and got really in deep in down in the rabbit hole. But the um, deal is, is that the parks board designed this kind of newer modern playground uh, thing to replace it and got really far down. I think they had bids or something. And then the city council, including Doug Doust, who was kind of the leader on the original Fantasy Forest. And he was, I think, the mayor, but now maybe he's a counselor, I forget. Anyways, he kind of put the, you know, ixnay on that, on kind of uh, the new stuff and wanted the, uh, another leathers design. And so they ended up, they had a lot of issues with like the, you know, I can't see my kid because all that, you know, blockage and stuff. I don't like that. So all the things that they didn't like, they kind of talked to leathers about kind of designing that out. Um, but they ended up doing another leathers design. And I don't, you know, I don't have any, I'm not a, of the same mind. I don't really care, but I, it was a huge kind of a public, uh, bit of a, a lot of drama and a lot of Facebook stuff and people coming to city council meetings and, you know, testifying and all that. So probably, you know, I'm just gonna <laughs> leave you with that and just kind of look into it a little bit, but probably wanna avoid something like that and figure out, you know, what what makes sense for us and what we can afford and, and all that. I know, you know, with the leathers design, that is, I think they end up bidding it low, you know, cause it is a design, it's a design build community built thing. So they saved a lot of money doing that. So that's, you know, I'm not saying that that's, I mean, it's efficient and economic, but like you said, in the long term, maybe, you know, maybe not so much, or maybe they don't use, maybe they use plastic wood now or the, you know, Trek stuff or something that doesn't have the uh, rot issues that we had. I don't know. But I, I'm sure you guys will kind of be able to look into it and figure out what's best for us. But just a little bit of a, you know, lesson learned from Troutdale. And that was like, what, a couple, two or three years ago or so. It was fairly recent. So, yeah, and it's great. Ultimately, what we're do planning on doing is um, definitely getting that community buy in with public open houses and online opportunities to engage just to not to get to that point of building something and people being really surprised. Wait, I didn't have a chance to give input to this because we know how valuable it is and how strong of opinions and how, you know, it's generations now that, that people have been playing on this. So getting that buy-in is critical. Yeah, my girlfriends were the leaders on that. Helpful. You guys yeah. building, so. I would just add one thing before you move Please. on, and that is um, obviously we have SDCs that are disposable for project at our disposal for projects like this. Um, grant funding we already talked about. Mm -hmm. I think just two other uh, points to add with the restoration of the creek, I'm sure there's some um, additional grants that are not just parks and rec related, but yeah. uh, clean water association grants that we could be um, going after for that restoration work. And then the, we call it the lower city hall parking lot, I guess you could call it the upper mining parking lot, whatever, <laughs> how, whatever you want to refer to it as. That parking lot is within the urban renewal district and public parking is an urban renewal expenditure that's uh, approved under our existing urban renewal plan. And so I don't want to rule out that funding mechanism for the refurbishment of that. Um, it really does increase the capacity for the park. We've used it in a different way coming out of COVID for food and drinks during um, uh, concerts in the park and movies in the park. And so, you know, there's some safety issues that need to be addressed with that lot as it is. Um, but just wanted to note that there is an additional funding source for that specific project as well, even though it is related to the park, we've got a, a separate pot of funds that we could use for um, improvements there. Is that apartment building that's going in there going to affect it? It's not. Um, our parking lot is all within our property. There okay. might be some cleanup with hedges and things like that, but it won't uh, impact the footprint of that. Um, and Kelly O'Neill and I have already walked that parking lot because it was a topic that came up earlier later this late spring. Early, I guess we're still in early summer, um, about what could we do and what would the requirements be to refurbish that? Is there gonna be a stormwater implication, things like that? Um, but because we're just resist, uh, replacing an existing parking lot, um, we don't run into a lot of headaches that we would if we were creating a new parking lot there. Um, 
So I think a, a lot can be achieved with some bushes being removed and added light pole for lighting and good, you know, uh, safety sight lines from upper city hall parking lot and the building here down to that lot. Um, and then some new pavement and uh, some, you know, low maintenance shrubbery and things like that. But we could do quite a bit for not a huge amount of money at that site. Did you need anything else from us? No, thank you. That was, I, I think we have very clear, uh, but I agree. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, you guys. All right. Draft values and outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so C4 met, I think I sent uh, this document out to the council mm -hmm. middle of last week or so. Um, C4 met several weeks ago in a retreat mm -hmm. to have um, their annual retreat to talk about upcoming priorities. Uh, the first day was spent focused on transportation, which is what you have in front of you this evening. The second day was spent um, on housing, and that has not risen to the top or, or warranted another conversation yet. But the feedback from all the different communities in Clackamas County was taken to develop this list of joint values and outcomes that is before you this evening. Um, so C4 is really just looking for feedback from electeds on what they like, what they don't like, anything they want to see uh, tweaked on here. I'll submit those um, modifications or requested revisions back to C4 um, end of this week. And then they'll make a final draft and ultimately we'll have the option to sign on to that final draft at our logo to whatever sort of document gets developed. Um, so tonight, just seeking feedback. If there's any glaring issues, or um, comments you want to have, I will take those and pass them along. And uh, you can all, you know, do them in writing as well if you want to. I'll, I'll, I'll say it on the record. Uh, so one of the issues I have with this is I, I just, I would really like to know what in here benefits the city of Sydney. And this seems more like a county document that the county board of commissioners should be signing and at a local level. Um, I just struggle with a lot of these things are going to end up valuing communities more towards the west side of our county, and we end up kind of where we continue to remain. There's nothing in here for smaller jurisdictions that I'm really looking at. Um, there's nothing here for um, very little dimension, and nothing that really mentions uh, your more rural communities. Uh, which I kind of feel like as as a, from a county perspective, that's where we fit. And so I mean this I would I would vote no for this as it says. That's where I said. Anyone else have some? Yeah, I would um, add to Rich's thoughts about it not really being applicable to Sandy. And if you just are considering this is a countywide uh, I, it just doesn't look like the mountain top exactly. was very much involved, which again comes back to what C4 seems to be really good at. If it's inside the metro, there's a lot of money and they end up supporting a lot of the projects there. And it doesn't seem like the money that can be used in a variety of areas gets used in the East County part of Clackamas. And it, it just seems like this is kind of, uh, once again, we are looking at not, no real big focus on the East County. And I have friends up on the mountain up uh, behind Furwood who have had to deal with uh, culverts that haven't been repaired for months and months and uh, difficult crossings and places where the uh, maintenance has just been deferred for years in some cases. And then there are a number of places inside the city of Sandy that we interact or we should interact with County about it. Uh, I'm thinking about the Ten Eyck Road. We 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 have some real difficulties there. I'm, what a mess that is, uh, both with the offshoot of 26 onto Ten Eyck. Uh, that seems like we have uh, no, they have no interest in helping us further down the road in Ten Eyck as we exit the city. Uh, the other ones are out towards uh, 211 and 362nd. It just seems like there are places that we we, we would really need to have some focus on some of the road maintenance, some of the road uh, corrections that we just don't see here. And that doesn't even apply to be a priority in a general format. So I'm with Rich. I struggle with proving this. 
So I, Tyler, I said I just sent you a digital copy, and I I did Perfect. go through it and I read the draft. Maybe it's maybe I'm a little more naive because I'm newer, <laughs> but I think there's a couple points where they talk specifically about including our voice in in the transportation <laughs> issues. Um, the first bullet under the first header: developing collaboration with local voices and jurisdictions. I added to that when I sent it to him. I changed some of the verbiage so it was it was more succinct, I think. And then on the second bullet, to ensure maximum and efficient utilization of public dollars, it's provide local jurisdictions with the resources to implement state requirements. I think those are generalized bullet points saying give the money back and we can include ourselves in that. So I don't want to steer you away because I do agree with what you're both saying about it. I don't think it affects Sandy as much as it does the, the metro area. But this document does give credence to our county, which we're a part of. And if we want to be a, if we want to get any of the money from the county, we should be a part of solving that and offering suggestive language to get rural county more included. And I didn't do that in my, I just cleaned up what you sent us. I didn't add anything about rural community with it, which that might be something if I have a few more days I can think about, but um, because I do agree, we need do need to get money steered towards us so that we can sign and, and be a part of what the C4 is doing. That's just my lens. I spent four years on C4 um, and it's a very frustrating process. It's probably the most important meeting that I hated to go to. It just was very, very frustrating because the, it just seems like the, the design of the rules and the way Metro slash Portland really uh, affected all of the Clackamas County. It just seemed like it was just, uh, the house was betting against us and we just, always struggle to get some sort of interest, not only just in Sandy, but up the mountain, the Welches, the Timberline kinds of places on Clackamas County, and even Estacada and Malala was always struggling with that. So uh, maybe from my viewpoint, I'm a little bit uh, critical, more critical, but having seen some of that not being very well dispersed, uh, I can't tell you how many times they promised me would take the Metro monies, apply it to the places where it needed to be over on the West County and the monies that could be spread otherwise will send your way. It never really happened. Well, this is, I just think this is just our opportunity to oh, arm sure. Tyler yeah. with the mm -hmm. ammunition he needs mm -hmm. to go up there and get more language to, to make mm -hmm. us more relevant. Mm -hmm. sure. Um, sure. Which is exactly what I'm asking. I'm just asking yeah. for, and I, I mean, I would, I would uh, ask that, uh, you know, the, those, happy to do it too, but share those sentiments with Estacada Malala. And some of them, you know, maybe not so much can be, but even maybe can be. Um, because I kind of feel like, again, uh, to Carl's point, all of the resources tend to get diverted to the, I, I get it, higher population sure. uh, and, and, and higher traffic. I get it. But I think that um, there needs to be some mention of rural, smaller, local communities outside of our voice that's i mean we have a voice but i don't know what it gives us i agree with you yeah. my biggest takeaway on this was i felt it was overly broad and not very specific mm -hmm. no. so um so it, i think we can incorporate maybe a little more specificity sure. and maybe get what these gentlemen are all talking about kind of into that language as well um so i i uh i agree with everything y'all have said um <clears throat> the thing that I don't know is is kind of what, you know, if we were to say, well, give us money for some projects, you know, what are the county roads that are the highest priority? You know, is it Ten Eyck? Is it Kelso? Is it what? I don't know. You know, obviously, what else we, do we want to see on State Highway 26? And, you know, and so spending some time in the next year to kind of figure out what our priorities are, both on county roads and, and on State Highway, would just be helpful, I think to then you know make us you know more relevant at yeah. the table. I think there's a, a good opportunity for some, you know, either a joint work session or behind the scenes meetings with just better filtration of information between what is the state doing, what's the county doing, and what are we doing, where all of these uh roads mm -hmm. connect, right? Um so I can work on that for sure. Mm -hmm. I can pass along the comments. Um I'd like to see some I mean I know we can't get nitty gritty. <clears throat> But something that guides <coughs> feedback towards 211, where we're going to be yeah. responsible for yeah. those pedestrian yeah. improvements mm -hmm. at a significant cost. Nothing in here gets me towards there. Okay. One other thing that uh, I might bring up, and listen, uh, just as we were talking, I just mm -hmm. hit me that we haven't really discussed the fact that maybe the 
most populous part of the counties, the tri counties, the Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas counties. Population emphasis is down in the Portland area and Lake Oswego and that country. But a lot of our people who are employed downtown Portland come from the rural areas. And those roads that move those peoples from, you name it, Sandy's is uh, basically a bedroom city now, are those rural roads that get that population base down into the uh, businesses that are downtown Portland that are supposedly taking a, a lot of that emphasis for the monies. But in terms of how you get people from here to there, you know, there are, uh, we're talking about efficiency, we're talking about road maintenance, which if the potholes and the difficult roads are part of the problems with cars, maintenance of those things. So that transportation system depends a lot on where people are sleeping at night mm -hmm. and how they get to where the big population centers are. We need to recognize that that's a big cost too, not just where they end up parking for the day at their business offices. It's how we drive from downtown Sandy or the metro or the uh, a residential part of Sandy down to the like the Costco's and that kind of place. Sure. Can I add one more thing to that too? Yeah. So, you know, the one thing about that, as the metro area grows, specific to Sandy, on both of our highways that run through here, 26 and 211, um, as the metro area grows, so does the taxing of our resources on those roads. Because we're not only the gate, not not to, to Carl's point, I 100 percent agree, but we're also the gateway to the to central Oregon. Oh, sure. Yeah. So all as that goes, every time somebody wants to go to Bend for the weekend, more likely than not, they're coming through Sandy and affecting our traffic. And again, nothing in here really paints anything right. like that. So. All right. Well, I got feedback. That's what I needed. Um, it's due back to the county early next week. So if you have anything else you want to share with me, get it to me by Friday so I can uh, put it in draft form and get it sent to them. That would be very much appreciated. Okay. Thank you. All right, you're still up. I'm still up. Next. Um, let's see. So we have just a couple updates on uh, a few things and some reminders. Um, first, Nelly, since you're here, do you want to just come up and we can recap our meeting oh, yeah. we had today with uh, Christine Drazen. Um, we had an opportunity to meet with Representative Drazen and talk about wastewater. I'll let you as, oh, as our <laughs> <Surprise. laughs> friendly face yeah. talk about um that meeting, if you wanted to share a few words. No, it's it was an exciting meeting. It was nice to have uh, Representative Drazen or Representative Elect Drazen, um, you know, actually physically want to come to Sandy and be here. And she actually prior as a representative did not represent Sandy. So she's kind of getting acquainted with us, which was nice and definitely very interested. Um, she had several great recommendations. I'll let um, Jeff and Tyler um, kind of add to whatever I say, but, you know, she had some recommendations about actually um, going through the um, Gresham route, which we realize is more expensive, um, but it might be helpful in the very um, left-leaning uh, legislature to kind of partner with another city that might be somewhat helpful to Sandy was kind of my biggest takeaway. So Tyler? Yeah. Yeah, um, we will we'll have more information to share with you about that at an upcoming meeting, um, all of our wastewater <laughs> options. So I don't want to dive into that. Yeah, right now. sorry, I went, I went. That's deep. okay. It's okay. Um, but <clears throat> we know, we she know gave what's us, coming, so we'll we'll make sure to be here. Yeah, she please. gave us some really interesting, not interesting, but really good feedback on, um, you know, how, how to maybe phrase an ask or how to talk about sure. what our ask is today versus what we need in 10 years and what's that on ramp to get to what we need in 10 years. And so I think just a, a fresh set of eyes and a new lens on exactly. um, how to work with the legislature was a really good outcome from the hour we spent with her today. Yeah. And we articulated um, that, you know, we're also, you know, we're not just solely focused on state funding that, you know, there's the county obviously and the feds and we're going down the list. And so we're doing our due diligence, meeting with the governor's office and whatnot has also been the regional solutions person. Tracy's been really, really great. Is that right? Kathy. 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 Yeah. So, no, I mean, it was just, yeah. it was, we've, as you know, I, mean, I think we recap when we meet with different representatives and, and different players in the game. This was just another meeting in our tool belt to get ourselves out there and say, hey, we've got this issue that we're working on. Um, 
how can you know you help advocate for us? What do you need from us so that you can advocate for us and just building that relationship? So yeah, another, yeah, it's been it'll one. it'll be exciting. There's going to be a lot of new people in the legislature, so I think that that that's going to be interesting. It's I, again, it's going to be a very complicated election cycle because we don't know what turnout's going to look like. Usually during a presidential election cycle, it's mm -hmm. you know have much higher turnout, mm -hmm. but this year, I don't know. Mm -hmm. How do we look at these other representatives and senators that are not representing our specific Sand Sandy City to influence it? Because we got Drazen and we've got Bonham, mm -hmm. and they are a small percentage of the um, the group that uh, is, makes it um, uh, Salem. How, how do we? How are we interacting with the other folks that have a lot of influence in those arenas and? Um, it, the two that represent us are in the minority of the, both houses. And um, how, how do we get those people to start thinking about Sandy and get past the thing that we just happened this last legislature where we got zero? Because it really still kind of eats at my craw a little bit. Me too. <laughs> Personally, <laughs> me too. You know, it's just, it's a process. I think, you know, it's finding alignments with others. And I think that that was why, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to necessarily say that the recommendation would be to definitely go down that route. But I mean, I think it's just partnering with other cities that have similar issues and really trying to diversify ourselves a bit more. Um, not that we haven't tri been trying that, but it's just a, there's a lot to maneuver, but I th I really think having Christine in office is going to be a new, it'll just be a new set of eyes, as yeah. Tyler said. Well, and so, I think, oh, I'm going to say, Tyler, uh, uh, in the past, we've said wastewater, 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 wastewater. This year, it's transportation, and that's our priority. How are we balancing that? Uh, I'm are we even going to ask for wastewater or some kind of sewer plan and help, or is this just off the list and we're going to ask for pavement? Oh, no, our our priorities will continue to be wastewater. I mean, that's the project that we have in front of us that needs funding. Um, C4's, you know, conversation we just had, that was uh, in relation to the upcoming legislature's uh, interest in transportation funding. But that doesn't mean that there's not funding on the table for other projects. And we'll continue to ask for those fund those funds. We'll continue to reach out, uh, you know, at the federal level as well for funding. So the the ask for wastewater support is not dead by any means. Um, well, the priority is not there. They tell me, but surely something else will be funded other than pavement on roads. We have road problems and issues that we probably should be fixing ourselves that we need state funding from. But again, it's still wastewater, wastewater, wastewater. But housing will still be a number one mm -hmm. priority issue mm -hmm. for the governor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really having our contacts in her office, I think is, it helps for sure. I mean, it's, we just want to keep the door open to make sure that, you know, as things progress and as we finally finalize kind of the direction that you all would like to go in, um, it, it's a good contact to have. Well, I think to that point, you know, housing, housing, housing has been sort of the the push in recent years. This is where, I don't even like to really phrase it this way, but where the moratorium helps our position, right? We are in a position where we can't continue to build, build, build because we have limits on our capacity. So um, that, that might be the silver lining of the moratorium mm -hmm. is that it puts us in a better position to ask for funds mm -hmm. to build this infrastructure that we need so that we can continue to construct housing in a mindful way that is you know, uh, controlled to the extent possible and done well and et cetera, et cetera, right? Not just rampant building, but done thoughtfully. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of that sort of plays together. So thank you, Nellie. Thank you. Thank I would you, just Nellie. point out Council President that we we do anticipate bringing the wastewater facilities amendment to the council next month. Yeah. So just for everyone's approach. Perfect. Um, we also, Jenny and I had our kickoff meeting today for water and wastewater SDC methodology updates. I know that's been a, a hot topic. We had the contract um, signed a few weeks ago, but finally had the kickoff meeting today to, to get that stuff underway. We also had our rating call today with S&P for um, closing the Whiffy loan. So last council meeting, 
the ordinance was passed. We'll bring a resolution forward at the next council meeting to really close that and finalize it. So uh, moving along with some of the funding package of the wastewater project as well. Um, reminder that we have the first movie in the park this coming Friday, Top Gun. Mm -hmm. um, and then just a brief recap on Mountain Festival. I'm told from Chief that we had very little incidents, almost call it a nothing no burger. Arrests. No arrests. It was a great um, weekend, very little negative impact. Um, so definitely what we like to see when there's that much foot traffic and car traffic coming through town. Um, Do you have an idea of the turnout compared to previous years? I haven't seen a number. I was going to check with Rochelle and see if some of that um, software they have for the park mm -hmm. uh, events, if that was something they could pull and see what we had. Um, but I haven't got any updates on that information yet. Um, and then, you know, we had the, the heat wave last week. Um, I sent out an email that Ant Farm was going to be temporarily housing people at Best Western. Um, if there was a need for that, uh, I heard from NUMPA that there was 23 people that were housed during that uh, heat wave or heat event at the Best Western. Um, they did room checks twice a day. There was no incidents. There was only police presence once, and that was when someone was brought in to get housing support um, during the heat uh, incident. So uh, again, another successful um, endeavor on their part to try to keep people out of the heat. Communication was great uh, between NUMPA and the city as far as letting us know that that was going to be an activity. I passed that on to you guys and then getting a recap from, from Ant Farm once it was done um, and hadn't heard anything from police. So um, just want to stress that there was, you know, post post work session that we had a few weeks back and reiterating that need for some additional communication on what services were being offered, that communication came through. And from my perspective, it was it was great. Um, and then something just put on your radar, the annual LOC conference is coming up. It's gonna be in Bend this year between October 17th and 19th. If you know right off the bat that you're interested in going, feel free to tell us now. Otherwise, <laughs> keep that on your mind. We'll continue to bring it up. Um, Registration opens though next week. Yeah, right. So my so <laughs> my process in the past has been to register everyone and then cancel them if we need to, which I can certainly do. But if you do know um, this week whether you're going to go or not, it or if you can't go, let me know and then I won't try when to get that extra room. Sorry, seventeenth to nineteenth of October. It's always Thursday through Saturday. I am out. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're out. You can put me down. You can put me down. Excellent. Eugene was good last year. I'm sure Ben will be equally as good. Um, I haven't gone to one in Bend yet, so it'd be nice to. It's at the River House. That was, that was fun. Yeah. Two years it's ago. Yeah, I didn't make it to nice. that one. Yeah. So. It's, it's the best one of the four that they typically mm -hmm. send us to. I wouldn't pick favorites. It is. I think. Quiet. So. Um, and then last. But not least for me, I was going to try to nail down a time to meet with um, the Code Enforcement Subcommittee. So there was a conversation several weeks ago about uh, Councillor Sheldon, Council President Smallwood, and Councillor Hokinson meeting to talk about some code enforcement um, uh, items. Councillor Hokinson is not here tonight. So is there a day, generally speaking, that works better for the two of you that I can try to back into something? Fridays are the best for me. Fridays are the best. Yeah, do them. Okay. I I uh, have had success with Councillor Hokinson for one on ones with him on Friday, so I think we can probably pencil in. Um, Friday, maybe we'll send a dual poll for the next three or four Fridays and see what we can get Perfect. Um, on the books. So just keep an eye out for that okay. uh, email. Are you for referring to both sides of the code enforcement or just the? Planning department. Just planning. Just planning. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I'm sure there'll be some other topics that get discussed in that inevitably, right? You start talking about one code enforcement issue and it trickles into another. So um, the, the intent is to focus on uh, the planning side of things, but I'm sure there's going to be other conversations that come up during that. So it's not, it's not individual enforcement actions. It's about yeah. streamlining our code. Right. right now, there's you know, six or seven different procedures for different things. It really ought to be all kind of consolidated and have a set procedure for all of code enforcement in Title 17. Make it clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is all I have, I believe. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Carl. Uh, so we talked a couple of months ago, Chief, uh, about the uh, Bell Street. You know, we're out of school now, but 
fall will arrive soon. Have we got any movement on Bell Street uh, trying to get emergency vehicles planned out, thought through? We got a time deadline before the school starts to see yes. if we can't correct that or decide what to do. Yes. So um, I do have, do you have that picture? I do. Let me. I have a photo uh, for you of a police car parked as close to the curb as possible and a fire truck trying to get by. And it would be successful as long as we don't want our mirrors. <laughs> well, if no the mirrors, huh? police car is anywhere out from the curb at all, the fire truck cannot pass mm -hmm. at all. Yes. How wide is the fire truck? They are they are wide. More than the standard eight feet. Yes. For, yeah. Some of them are nine and a half feet wide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So ambulances uh, wouldn't make it or would make it? I don't believe so. Okay. Well, the road is 16 feet wide. Yeah, but here's the thing, and I notice this keeps coming up, and it's becoming a point of frustration to the person who drives fire engines for a living, is that people, there is an assumption, I believe, in, in some people's minds, that when cars pull over for emergency vehicles, they pull over parallel up against the curb, and that's not what happens. They nose in, leaving their tail Correct. out, because they're trying to get out of the way, because there's cars in front of them, and there's oh, cars sure. behind them. Right. So it's not this perfect little everybody scoots over and merges. That's not what happens. Emergency vehicles have to have access in the event of an emergency. That's what they're for. Right. So I don't understand why there's so much pushback on this topic. The road's not wide enough. Okay. <laughs> well, because here's, here's the pushback that you're going to get. is because what I'm seeing is people are doing something illegal. And instead of dealing with the people that are doing something illegal, we're going to go spend even more money to go widen the street so they can do something illegal. We, so we that's where that, so we, nobody's we, upset. We, okay. so nobody's upset. Kind of well, well I mean, no, I wasn't. I didn't name any names. So yeah, I, well, yeah, I'm, I'm the one who's yeah, yeah, uh, just asking you. Yeah. Yeah. I get that picture that 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 going around. It's on my phone. It doesn't it have an email. So I was just kind of, I was just curious. I can share it with. I like big shiny trucks and cars. I can share it with the council after this. Yes. So. So in addition to the picture, um, uh, Chief Elect, <laughs> Chief Selected Husky, um, and I have a meeting with Aaron Bayer coming up. I thought that his input might be helpful, a fresh set of eyes, and to get him involved in the situation. Also, seeing as he, he's the one that's going to have to be, you know, picking the ball and running from here. So we have a meeting the first week. I think it's on this fifth or sixth they'll quote me it's like that first week of august maybe the seventh with Aaron at the school district well, and that's one of the topics to discuss I, I don't know that we need to build a new road or anything there may yeah. be other alternatives if you I talk about maybe the other road other we have we've talked about open. several different al alternatives yeah. including the grassy where we shoot off the fireworks that grass big oh, grassy right. field making that some gravel so there's a place to get off the road. We've talked about using the fire lane around behind the back of the school. He was going to check with the there fire marshal on that. Mm -hmm. We've talked about there's a walking path-ish kind of wide path from where the tennis courts are to the main parking lot okay. and having that um, be incorporated in some sort of a staging area. So we're looking at all of the options available to us. Um, and then we'll have to just decide what what one is most efficient and best use. And hopefully we'll have something that can go out to parents before the start of the school year. That's our goal. That was my question. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't mean to disrespect anybody, but has has the school district even thought about getting a traffic engineer to, to look at the flow and see if there's a more efficient way in the whole design of their process? I realize that's a cost to them. He, he hasn't right. stated that at all but my impression from him or what he said is if it costs money it costs money he's not he hasn't been pushing back in any way mm -hmm. and quite frankly i think all three of us have been pretty tied up and just haven't been able to meet again mm -hmm. uh, we we all have pieces of the pie that we need to get back together and put mm -hmm. and put it together mm -hmm. um, but with mountain fest and all this other stuff we've been kind of tied up and that hasn't been right here which is why perhaps the school district needs to pony up and pay for somebody to do a study and, and figure out the design best design for that process yeah, yeah. Um, here's what i hear though is 
fall's coming in <laughs> September. We need to have something in plan, something that works, even if it's clumsily. Uh, we just don't want to have portions of the city inaccessible mm -hmm. um, more. Well, we, we might be able to find a, a short-term stopgap. Yeah. Like I said, the field across the street or some other issue, at least for now. <clears throat> the Portland the Portland Airport has a cell phone parking staging area. You know, mm -hmm. when they're ready to go, they pull in there. They, mm -hmm. There's lots of I think you're right on. Just find different ways. Yeah. Just a spot. Might be a combination too. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh got a couple things happened to me this weekend uh, that were a little interesting. And one was spectacular. I had my oldest granddaughter was running out of the house when it was about 95 degrees this past weekend. And running to a car and she slipped and fell and she fainted about three times. And so we were totally scared. And uh, I called 911 and those guys were there, I tell you, as fast as I, I, I'm sure they were down in the mountain festival area doing something, probably talking and they, they were there just Johnny on the spot. And I can't tell you how glad I was they were there. Professional, did a good job, comforted, gave us options, all the little machinery and everything they were probably five or six different uh, tablets all clicking away and watching all kinds of different things on my granddaughter. I just can't say enough about those guys. Just Johnny on the spot, great uh, re experience for me, other than the fact that I was scared completely. <laughs> Wasn't sure I was gonna lose a granddaughter there for a bit, but just wonderful thing. Uh, as uh, the Mountain Festival kind of closes down, uh, and I heard some things from the chief about evaluating those kind of things, uh, there were a couple things that came up uh, that sounded a little bit uncomfortable, and uh, uh, I can share some of them now, but I just, are we going to be doing some um, review, checking how things went, and seeing how as we grow, and I'm certain we're going to be growing, and now the pandemic is behind us, and we see there's a lot of things that happened downtown. Uh, there were a number of parking issues that I heard that were difficulty. There were some things that happened during the parade that uh, were uh, awkward uh, to say the least. And so I don't know, are we planning on doing something with the parade folks or is that entirely on their backs? Like is the police gonna be doing some of that? Uh, yeah, I don't know what's been vehicles? done in prior years debriefing with Mountain Festival. Yeah, generally we do it from our perspective and not necessarily with the parade okay. folks. Um, I'm happy to listen and see what. Sure, I just throw some things out. Knowing you. exactly what you're talking about might give me some better guidance sure. as to which direction. Sure, right. And who to talk to. Okay. And and thank you for bringing it up, though, because mm -hmm. we haven't heard anything to date, yeah, so that's saying. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't always get really big complaints from people, <laughs> but I'm usually in the parade. This is the, one of the first time in many years that I've sitting on the edge and sort of a different perspective. Okay. Um, and finally. I really want to compliment, I guess they're gone. Oh, well, the parks and um, public works folks, whoever's doing the islands and the and the uh, sidewalks and the strips of vegetation that just really look starting to look much better. And I think I complimented them last time, but they aren't just using, uh, I don't know what they're using, uh, misery whips or tomahawks to cut some of the grass in some places that looks like they were finally using mowing machines. And I uh, appreciate that very much. And, and with that, I'm done. Thank you, Colonel. Kathleen. Um, the library uh, advisory board is meeting um, probably Wednesday. Right? I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, they are, we're going to be looking at our strategic plan updates. Um, we're looking at kind of the final link, the that um, kind of the database stuff for. Um, how we get our books, um, strategic direction, um, and and just kind of looking at different uh, visions, missions, values, tactical plans that have been um, developed by the different library directors in Clackamas County. So that really, Sarah's going to um, be busy kind of updating us on all that. The Hoodland Rent, um, we had a bunch of our advisory board members from the Mountain area uh, and other people go to the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners and talked about the need for um, helping out with the Hoodland rent. It was um, as kind of confusing and not as successful as it was the last time. There was you know, some people kind of saying, well, if we do it here, we have to do it for everybody else, which 
you know, of course, they've already given, you know, the uh, Oak Grove and some other ones, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So um, I think that it is sad that Hoodland seems to kind of be the getting the short end of the stick um, all the time. So we're going to continue to try to kind of uh, work on that and see if there's not some uh, some way through there. Um, yeah, so um, that's library. The fireworks, um, a great job from everybody on the city side, but also Clackamas County Bank. I We just really enjoyed it. It was a great show. Um, so yeah, that was fun. And uh, and yeah, ditto with the um, Mountain Festival and all the kids' activities and things like that. So um, really appreciate all that hard work uh, on the, um, I know there's a lot of public works folks involved with Mount Festival and police and parks and rec and all those folks. So appreciate all their involvement. We'll pass that along. And lastly, we did have the water and sewer uh, wastewater committee uh, briefing and that was quite interesting. Um, so there is like Tyler said, kind of some upcoming um, reviews of options and things like that, that we're gonna hear more about and and anxious to kind of have that discussion. So stay tuned. It was kind of a little bit of a surprise to me, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to see our, our um, amended wastewater uh, treatment plan done. We'll bring that back in August. Yeah. Have a larger conversation. Yeah. Rich, you're up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to start off. Thank you to Clackamas County Bank again mm -hmm. for the fireworks. That's awesome. Every and I know they've been doing that for as long as I remember. So I think that's super awesome. So just thank you publicly on that. Uh, I have a couple questions. I have a lot. Actually, I got a lot of questions tonight. Uh, but the first one is uh, employee volunteer program, and we had talked about that before. Yep. Um, is that something that continues to move along? And, and where do we look like? Yeah, I really just need to put together a staff report and bring it back to council for adoption at this point. Um, so I think you and I spoke about kind of the program that I, um, the, the idea that I outlined, um, that'll be very easy to implement, um, just needs to get the council approval at this point. So I'll try to prioritize that and bring it back in August, but that'd be right. Um, yeah, it, in the near future for sure. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, the next thing is, um, so Kathleen or someone mentioned an apartment or something going over here. Where's where's that going? It's the townhomes. Um, Do you know where the lower parking lot is? Yeah. Well, lower city hall yeah, parking lot, yeah. upper mining parking lot. There's a field just adjacent to that okay. currently. I think it's twelve units. Is that right? It's not very large. No, it's small. Um, yeah. Large enough. Yes. Yeah, large enough. That's true. Problems. Um, <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be a tight fit, but it's gone through land use and planning and all that. So to Carl's point right there, my, my concern is, uh, you know, specifically with that parking lot, as well as the one we just purchased, uh, I do know on condensed housing, sometimes there's parking sprawl that occurs. And I'd like to make sure that in our code, that very in the near future, before that is done, that we address that. I don't want that to turn into additional parking for our town yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so that just popped in my head when we were listening. Uh, the last thing is, um, the uh, I watched most of the video that CIS sent out about the post Supreme Court ruling on. Uh, well, I know it is Grant's past decision, but mm -hmm. I, it has another. Um, what is that? That's the incorporate. That's the state law now. Uh, whatever the Johnson v. something or something. Oh, Grant's past v. Johnson. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I would like to also um, know. And I'm watching that, if I understand it correctly, I think it may be an appropriate time to maybe even look and reconsider what our time, place, and manner restrictions are. And then I also really want to reiterate that um, we enforce the specifically in our, in our areas that are designated no camping, that that occurs. Um, but it seems like it's... Uh, Almost every morning, there's the same individual. I'm assuming given the cart and everything, but and so I realize it's probably just one or two. But even the other day, um, when we went down to Mining Park, the you know it's it, they're in the the shelters and stuff, and so I just really want to make sure that we're stressing that there's far more than I believe we had landed on a shopping cart worth, which had a we had the dimension 
but there's far more than that. And so I'd really like to revisit those. Um, and I'd really like to hear, uh, bring something back to council so that we can all affirm or disaffirm our, 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 our values in that. And, and so that we can give proper direction and guidance okay. moving forward. Because it sounds like there may be some uh, misconceptions out there. So just really kind of bring it back around, circle back around. This is what our, our rules are and these are our expectations. Yes. Absolutely. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll be even shorter because you guys all said everything I was going to say. Oh, yeah. so I'd just like to publicly say thanks to the Clackamas County Bank again for um, their support for the fourth. Fireworks were great. Sat on the football field. It was excellent, except for the kids that kept pushing the, the fake dummy in front of me. <laughs> they were running into me, but it, it was kind of cool. Anyway. But, um, and then uh, I spent two days at my day during the, the fest, and it was excellent. I did miss the parade, though, so I apologize for that. Um, but um, thanks for our community for everything that was done there. That's yeah, uh, thanks to Clackamas County Bank. I mean, it's already been said, but uh, they're such a great community partner. Um, so always super excited uh, to have them be a good partner. Um, to Rich's point, because it's still half of my thunder, um, I would like to convene the Homeless Task Force, yeah. uh, maybe preferably before some of that stuff comes to council um, it's so, that, so that we can have kind of a conversation and then Maybe that's not such an open, open-ended conversation by the time it gets back here. Sure. Um, and some of the maybe some of the questions that some of these individuals we know will have, we can address beforehand. Um, so that was kind of my main thing was with that with that verdict and recognizing that House Bill thirty one fifteen is is definitely still there and and I I'm sure there'll be other litigation come out of this and and other things and I know that. Uh, some of the powers that be in Portland have made some very strong statements about what they will and won't do and, and whatnot. But uh, we definitely, I would like us to get ahead before we get behind, yeah. And I think there's some confusion with our code too, because the some of the camping language makes, is creating some confusion amongst the officers on what we can and can't do. So some guidance would be really appreciated. Perfect. That would be the goal is to come out and say that this is what it is. And I think after this Supreme Court decision, we're able to more clearly define. And that's the, my takeaway is that we're able to more clearly define what those time, place, and manner restrictions are. But just for my edification, our our ordinances um, comply with 3115, doesn't it? Yes. 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 Yep. And so I had sent out, um, I think immediately after yes, the Supreme Court ruling. Yeah. Right. Some information to the council. I also um, sent a couple questions to our city attorney who has been on vacation but is back in the office. So, Josh, not to put you on the spot, but if there's anything that you feel like you should share right now since we're talking about this, or if you'd rather politely decline until we have a homelessness task force meeting um, convened, that's also fine. But if you are listening in and want to share anything that might be helpful, you'd be welcome. Yeah, today today is my first day back. Still getting caught up on email. Haven't gotten to that one yet, but I will this week. Perfect. And, that, no. and that's fine. Yeah. So that's just kind of the, the main thing so that we can definitely get ahead of some stuff. Um, and I think that's really all I got. Yeah. I will adjourn the meeting at 8.32.